Chapter One of A Candle for Our Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Therese. A Candle for Our Lady by Regina Victoria Hunt. Chapter One. Jem Reynolds stiffened to the challenge of Ralph Weaver, the sheep herder's son. Terms of the lease say you're to enclose only the pasture. Well? Ralph was two, perhaps three years older than Jem's thirteen years. A big, loutish youth, with a broad face and eyes like pale blue marbles. What if we make this part of the pasture? He swept out his arms to include the surrounding Bedford fields, grass-grown and starred with meadowsweet, then brought his hands to rest on the rail fence of the enclosure. Jem's dark eyes smoldered. It's against the law and the contract, the contract your father made with mine when he leased these ten acres of our freehold. That's what of it, Ralph Weaver. Oh, no, we're well within the statute of 1534. One-eighth arable? You've turned it all to meadow. Ralph laughed. Not quite. A harrow driven across yon field will fill the conditions of the law. He winked to emphasize the shrewdness of the reckoning. It's a trick, Jem cried, anger flushing his strong-jawed yet sensitive face, to think that his father, now three years dead, had been deceived by such petty schemesters. A cheap, dishonest trick, worthy of cheating tradesmen turned sheep shearers. Ralph's light eyes went lighter. He thrust his broad face over the fence. You impudent churl, son, I've a mind to— but Jem had vaulted the fence to land a solid blow on his tormentor's jaw. Taken by surprise, Ralph teetered and almost lost his footing on the damp rolling ground. He raised a hand to his jaw, regarding Jem as he would a gentle sheepdog gone suddenly on a rampage. "'Take it back,' said Jem, his brown eyes looking black and sparked with anger, his small but sturdy body tensed for a new assault. "'No Charles breed are we,' but landed freeholders these hundred years and more. But Ralph had recovered now. I'll show you how I'll take it back, you impudent. And catching Jim by the front of his russet jerkin, he tried to thrash him with a leather-thonged whip in his right hand. Jim was too quick for him, though. Hot with fury, he dived under Ralph's outswung arm, and turning, twisted the whip from his hand. But before he could swing it back to strike, Ralph, with his longer reach, had him again by the jerkin, and thrusting out his foot, tripped and threw him. Arms akimbo, he threw back his head and laughed uproariously at Jem sprawled on his back. Only for a moment. The next, Jem was up and springing with a force that knocked the big youth off his feet. Jem fell with him, and the thud brought blood to his head and loosed his grip on the whip. But he clung to his enemy, raining blows where he could, and receiving them back with interest and since the ground was sloping in moist from October rains, they were rolling, barrel-wise, down the length of the enclosure, while the wan light faded, and the weaver sheep looked on with neutral eyes. Someone else was looking, too, and hurrying toward the scene from the Reynolds side of the enclosure, with the quick bounding steps of eleven years. From his uncertain position on top of Ralph, Jem knew without looking that it was his sister Joan. Jem, what are you up to? And you, Ralph Weaver, a man almost. Why don't you pick a fight with someone your own age? Stay out of this, Joan. Jem turned to give her an angry look. But Ralph took advantage of the second that Jem's head was turned, pushed him off, and staggered to his feet. Sorry, Miss Joan, he said, but your hot-head brother was spoiling for a fight. As you see, this is our side of the enclosure. Your side? Jim echoed hotly. Jim, Joan commanded, leave off this brawling, or I'll fetch Cousin Will to make you. That'll not be necessary, said Ralph Weaver. I have more important tasks than the basting of a wild boy. He recovered his whip in the grass and twirled it with an arrogant look at Jim. Good day to you. And he went swaggering up the slope, leaving Jim to turn in fury on the girl. Why did you, Joan? Couldn't you see I was giving him what he asked for? I saw you would like to get some bones broke. 
Joan looked at the trickle of blood that oozed from Jim's underlip and bruised left jaw. Jim heaved himself over the fence, not quite so agilely as the first time. Why, I was on the point of thrashing the bully when you had to interfere. That's a girl for you. Joan took his hand. Come. Where? To the well, of course, to rid you of these signs of battle. Seeing the reasonableness of this, Jim submitted and washed his face in clear cold water from the well, near the path leading to the rear of the farmhouse. Joan gave him her checkered blue and white apron to wipe on. It won't help us, Jim, to attack the weavers or invade their property. But it isn't their property. Twas only a ten-year lease our father made them. I don't know, Jim. Cousin Will told Grandmother yesterday that we'll have to sell it outright before Martinmas, less than a month away. And, says he, we can thank God, if that's the only sale we'll be forced to make. Jim dropped down on the wellstone, his feet spread and his head hanging. The crops are poor, he admitted, have been even before father died. The very reason he had to lease these ten acres to the weavers. Ay, the best acres we owned, and these sheep shearers have turned it to pasture. Well, as grandmother says, what can't be mended? Look, Jim. Joan interrupted herself, tugging at his jerkin. No, the other way, toward the old mill road. Strangers on fine horses, too. Jem followed her gaze across the hundred yards or so of yellow stubble, where the corn had been newly harvested, to the yew hedge that marked the farm's boundaries. The rare sight of horsemen on the little travel track brought him to his feet. I wonder whence they are. The travelers paused, their fine mounts gently pawing the turf, and Jem strode toward them, while Joan caught up her gray homespun skirts to keep up with him. Good day, my masters, he called out before he reached the hedge. Then, remembering his recent encounter, he smoothed his rumpled black hair, crisply curling to the earlobes, and straightened his jerkin. The younger of the strangers had already seen them and was hailing them. My lad, and you, little maid, can you direct us? We've quite lost the road. Jem looked up at the figure on the tall chestnut and liked what he saw. The clean, manly face under the bronze velvet cap was lit by friendly hazel eyes. His long, supple body wore the full doublet and sable-collared cloak with youthful grace. "'We're from Hunts,' the young stranger pointed with his riding crop toward the north-bordering county. "'We sought a shortcut to London, but we got lost along the banks of yon small river, and wound up here without an idea in the world where we are.' "'This is Reynolds Farm, sir, in Iworth Parish.' Jim spoke the family name proudly. We're some three, four miles off the great north road. And tis dusk already. What say you, uncle? We can scarce reach Sir John Onwick's tonight. The older man, gray-haired and stockier, nodded in agreement. True, and I'm not over fond of your small-town common inns. Bagelsway would be the nearest, Joan offered. And crowd it now, Jim added as it is a market town, and this harvest time. He thought of making a proposal, but hesitated, fearing a refusal. The younger man's lively eyes met his own. What say you, lad? Could your parents put us up for the night? Brother and sister replied together. Oh, we'd be honored to have you. That is, Jim added, if you don't mind simple fare. Good, we'll pay you well. How do you like the plan, uncle? Suits me well. Then the older man smiled. Country squire that I am, a saddle never was my favorite seat, and today I've had more than enough of it. Twas well thought on, Dickon lad. He patted the young man's shoulder. Jem ran to open a small wood gate in the hedge. Then with pride in his voice he called to Joan. Tell grandmother we'll have gentry tonight. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of A Candle for Our Lady by Regina Victoria Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Two. The younger man made the introductions as they went. I'm Richard Norris, and this is my uncle, Anthony Norris of Norham Hall. 
He has law business in London, while I'm to take up my duties at court. Jem's eyes lighted. In King Henry's service? Aye, though a small place, probably no more than a groom of the chamber, at first. It's a beginning, for which I hope my four years at Cambridge will have prepared me. So this is Reynolds' farm? Yes, and I'm Jem, James Reynolds. Joan is my sister, and our parents are dead. Ah, so young a master. This came from the elder Mr. Norris with a smile. Jim flashed him a quick, shy smile in return. Not really. Cousin Will. He pointed toward the fields where a heavy-built, sunburnt man supervised the hands. Cousin Will manages the farm. Indeed, works himself with the plow. My grandmother, Dame Cecily Reynolds, keeps house. An excellent arrangement, Mr. Norris observed. As they reached the stable, he tried to dismount. Seeing his difficulty, Jim sprang to assist him. Thank you, my lad, thank you. An old man unused to the saddle grows plagued stiff after a day's journey. Richard Norris laughed. Uncle, one would suppose you a full hundred years instead of about half that. It's that you've sat too long over your chess games and your deep draughts of rosemary-flavored ale. It is not. It's that I've sat too long over chines of beef and fat capones and roast mutton. The uncle turned to Jim. Avoid rich fare and the penalty of gluttony, boy. In a word, gout. That won't be hard, sir. We see little meat save salt pork. But we do have a good vegetable garden. Jim did not want to depress the gentleman too greatly with the prospect of the fare. Mr. Norris examined the sandy soil. Greens, yes, you would have. Yet it appears you have a fair field, too, for rye and barley. And all in a piece, Richard remarked, so you're not dependent on the common. No, except for mill and meadow. My father exchanged and sold little by little until our holding was as you see it. Except, Jim added bitterly, for yon ten acres leased to tradesmen turned sheep owners. Mary, help us, Richard Norris exclaimed, the eternal plaint of the age, sheep pastures, enclosures monastic suppressions. Jim questioned him as they entered the barn stacked with hay and fodder and began unsaddling the horses. You mean they are closing the convents and monasteries? Surely, you've heard, lad. Oh, only the small houses, those having twelve or less religious to maintain them. That began even before his grace King Henry defied the Pope. We've heard something, but we thought it was just here and there. Jim proceeded to bed down the chestnut. What a beautiful coat! Did you breed and rear him? Aye, from an Arab sire. Richard looked around the stable used as a barn. Don't you keep a horse? Jim shook his head. Not since our old cob died. We use oxen for plowing. Cousin Will says they're stronger and eat less. But, he sighed, caressing the glossy coat, I'd love to have a horse. One day you will, Jemmy. Richard patted the boy's shoulder, stopping when the shadow leaped into the darkness of the barn. With a low, affectionate growl, it bounded to Jim, two big paws landing on his shoulders. Well, that's quite a dog. There, Shag, there, that's enough. Jim freed himself, and the big dog turned his attention to the stranger. Down, Shag, don't spoil Mr. Norris's clothes. Richard Norris laughed, patting Shag's great woolly head. Little damage Shag can do to these road-worn gear. But let's see how Uncle Tony fares. Emerging from the barn, they found Mr. Norris, with Cousin Will, on the edge of the harvest at Rye Field. The good yeoman was discharging his men, Mr. Norris said as they joined him, so I thought I'd learn a little of Bedford husbandry. So you still plow in strips, leaving every third fallow? The sturdy countryman nodded. One year, two is better, but... He shook his straw-colored head. We can't let it lie so long now. The floods of thirty-six, Mr. Norris observed. Aye, scarce a manor or farm in England wasn't affected by rolling crops. Some say twas a judgment of God upon the kingdom for what had been done, setting aside the good Lady Catherine and the Princess Mary, her daughter. Well, said his nephew, tis certain that those who contrive these things have seen some bad chickens homing to roost. Aye, nephew, the Lincolnshire rising, then the great pilgrimage up yonder in the north. But it's all over now, 
and the fearful lesson of the headings and hangings won't soon be forgotten. Nay, Master Thomas Cromwell, his grace the king's vicegerent, has left none with stomach to dispute his will. They turned toward the thatched farmhouse, the three men and the boy, with Shag lumbering after. But as they walked on in the blue-gray dusk, the mind of young Jim Reynolds was filled with a hundred thoughts, churning and fermenting. Next morning at Cockcrow, Jim rose from his straw bed in the loft, shivering as he dressed. He recalled the dinner talk of their guests, now occupying the room downstairs, all about the changes made by the hated Cromwell, and how these changes, especially those regarding the church, had provoked the mass protest known as the Pilgrimage of Grace. Jim couldn't understand it, for hadn't King Henry even been a staunch son of the church, a defender of the Holy See against the attacks of the German ex-monk Luther and his followers? Since then, of course, the king had broken with the Pope, because the Holy Father forbade him to put aside the good Queen Catherine and take another wife. But, said the Norrises, Henry still attended daily mass, still loved the sacrament of the altar, still venerated the mother of God, and would have none of Luther's heresies. All morning as he worked, helping Cousin Will with the reaping and threshing, and, what was real fun, feeding young Mr. Norris's chestnut in the gray, Jem's thoughts kept reverting to what his grandmother called these great matters. At noon, the Angelus bell from Iworth's stone-spired church pealed on the damp October air and sent them running to the house, where Dame Reynolds and Joan were busy setting table for their guests. Hurry, Jem, said his grandmother as he hastily washed off some of the sweat and soil in the stone water basin. The gentlemen will be on their way. I told them you would guide them to the main road. Jim felt a quick glow. It wasn't often that such a break in routine was offered. Thanks, Grandmother, but isn't Father Ledhall due today? Well, no matter. He'll excuse you from your lessons. As she spoke, there was a knock at the door. Joan went to answer it, admitting the priest, tall and lean with a kind scholar's face. The gentleman, already at table, rose in salutation. Jim heard his sister presenting Father Lead Hall to their guest, and he was invited to share the meal with them. Then the steaming meat pie, garnished with beans, peas, and cabbage, was set on the board table, with dark amber cider to drink, and wheat cakes with plum jelly for dessert. For a while, little was heard save the click of pewter dishes, wooden spoons, and knives. Richard Norris finally spoke up. Well, uncle, if we're to reach Sir John Almwick's in daylight, we'd better start. Aye, much as I dislike stirring from this comfortable fireside. Mr. Norris rose from the wooden settle, and Richard with him. Have you far to go? Father Lethall inquired. We're London-bound, Father, Richard replied, but we'll stop at my kinsman's near Amptill. Mr. Norris is in the King's service, Dame Reynolds explained. Jim's guiding them to the road, Father. She watched him snatch his knit wool cap from a peg on the wall. Maybe he'll be back for his lessons. Meanwhile, there's Miss Joan. The priest smiled kindly at the slim, gray-eyed girl, who was refilling his pewter tankard with pungent brown cider. Have you your horn book ready, young lady? I'll fetch it, father. While she ran to get it, the Norrises took their leave with many expressions of appreciation and a handsome donation of five silver florins. That will not come amiss, good woman said the priest, as Dame Reynolds hesitated to accept the money. Ah, indeed you're right, father, she sighed, settling down on the bench like a tired, dark-feathered bird. The harvest won't fetch much this year. But father, she dropped her voice, these gentlemen, is it true what they tell us, about the king's grace following the Lord Cromwell, that they'll close more and more religious houses and evict their tenants for the profit of the great landlords? It's far gone now along that road. Father Ledhall sipped the cider thoughtfully, perhaps foreseeing things better not discussed. And under King Henry? Dame Reynolds shook her head, still glossy black, save for one strip of silver on the side. You know, Father, my dear husband and I once made a pilgrimage to Our Lady of Walsingham. Oh, Grandmother! Joan had returned with her parchment primer. Tell about your pilgrimage. What, again? But the old dame's eyes twinkled. I should like to hear it, too, said the priest, and Joan threw him a grateful look. Well, Grandmother Reynolds began, it was the very year that the king's grace himself made the pilgrimage, though, of course, he was not long king. End of chapter 2 
Chapter Three of A Candle for Our Lady by Regina Victoria Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Three. After a bad year, things were going well with us. Your grandfather, Joan, had exchanged some land near Potom for the South Field. There was a good harvest. It seemed the whole country prospered and was full of praise for the good young Harry and his kind queen, the Lady Catherine. She was so, Father Ledhall put in. Once I was sent down to Greenwich on business with her almoner. A hard ride in a deluge of rain. But I was left, on arrival, in a drafty court while more important visitors were received. Then comes the queen, round and fair and smiling, like a rosy apple, and exclaims at my plight, Come, come, reverend sir says she, with just a trace of her native Spanish in her speech. If the queen's almoner can't receive you, the queen can. And she had me into her chambers, warmed at her fire, and drinking old ale, before she would hear my business. A right royal lady, he sighed, and Joan's lip trembled, remembering how the good queen had died, captive and alone. Poisoned, it was whispered, by the woman who had supplanted her, only to mount a scaffold herself. The king loved her, then, Dame Reynolds reflected. Remember, father, how in thanksgiving for the birth of an heir he rode down to Walsingham Shrine and died of winter? And offered a diamond necklace, Joan added, her eyes sparkling like jewels at the thought. Twas that gave my John and me mind to make the pilgrimage, but we must wait until after the spring sowing. So twas near Our Lady's Day in August that we set forth, John and me, Cousin Will and your father, Joan, a little lad just turned ten. Oh, what fun he had. But he got lost, my father, didn't he? Joan asked. Yes, on the last day of St. Swithin's Fair at St. Ives, and we had gone less than a two-day's journey. Well, back and forth we went among the thronged lanes of the fairway, but no sign of the lad. So with a word to the constable we fared on to overcoat, but heavy in mind lest he should have been taken by gypsies. But what do you think? As soon as we had crossed by ferry and come into the priory at Holywell, there sat the boy munching bread and cheese and telling the good monks of his adventure. And no sign of sorrow for the trouble and fury you had for him? The priest asked with a smile. Nay, father, not him. He only waved his hunk of bread at us and grinned, boasting. I got here faster. His father was chafed and minded to punish him, but I reasoned that the lad was safe when we were feared he might have come to harm so let it be, especially as we were making a holy journey. But aside, I told our James that surely it was the special protection of the Holy Virgin that preserved him, as we were going to pay her honor at Walsingham. Another time he might not come off so well. You did right, woman. Good counsel is better than punishment, and James Reynolds was as fine a man as I've known. God rest him. Amen, father. Shame it seems that the sweating sickness took him off in his prime, leaving his old mother, but so God willed it, and he never forgot our pilgrimage. I know, Grandmother, Joan spoke up. He used to speak of the slipper chapel where the pilgrims took off their shoes to go barefoot the last mile. Dame Reynolds laughed. And how he insisted on leaving his at the shrine because the infant Christ was barefoot. And of the great copper statue of the knight at the gate and the holy wells and the chapel itself, how Our Lady sits holding our Lord on her arm, and in the other hand a lily scepter, all decorated and gleaming. With King Henry's gift of diamonds, the most magnificent of all. Oh, but then there's his father's silver statue of himself at prayer, and all the gold and silver and jewels bestowed by the kings or predecessors, and the whole chapel filled with the scent of incense, and the sweet odor of melting wax from the forest of candles. Dame Reynolds folded her hands in her woolen shawl. I can never describe it. If only I could see it said Joan. Grandmother, you've often promised that we should. Yes, yes, when you are older. Now, she rose and gathered up the wooden and pewter platters and bowls. On with your lesson, girl. Reluctantly, Joan turned her attention to the prayers and ABCs lit on the vellum of her horn book. Try as she would, she couldn't concentrate and stumbled over her recitation. I, I'm sorry, father. What's the matter, child? Joan was usually a good student, quiet and attentive, unlike her restless, active-bodied brother. Is it the tale of Walsingham? Yes, father. We've been told. 
for oh so long that we would make the pilgrimage but grandmother always says when you're older now i'm eleven and jem's past thirteen leave it to me joan i'll talk to her you father the girl's joy radiated from her serious gray eyes oh thank you father ledhall rose and approached the spinning wheel dame reynolds i'm thinking twere well soon to permit these young ones of pilgrimage to our lady's shrine ay father but they're yet so young older than our father was joan interrupted but he was with us his parents even so remember he got lost and might have come to mischief you could go with them couldn't you the priest cast a glance at joan and she obediently disappeared into the curtained off bedroom look you dame father ledhall spoke quietly but forcefully above the wheel's loud humming as you heard from these gentry the lord cromwell's attack on the monasteries reaches farther than at first we thought and it's more serious than the king's breach with the pope which may at any time be mended such a good religious king dame reynolds shook her head her work knotted fingers slackened on the flax and her foot slowed on the treadle how can he permit perhaps he doesn't yet know or understand the import of his minister's course but it's public knowledge that henry's emptied the vast treasury his thrifty father left him that he's badly in need of money suppose now the lord cromwell who has been in italy and is said to have first-hand experience of florentine banking operations suppose he shows the king all the wealth of the country's clerical endowments and also the means whereby he can under color of reformation appropriate much of this wealth for the crown you mean father that all the monasteries convents priories all that our fathers have gathered and built with their love and toil and treasure these many ages could fall to sacrilegious hands it has happened before woman it is happening to-day in germany well the point is that if even the great monasteries are in danger what's to prevent the despoiling of chapels and shrines the king who offered a diamond necklace in fifteen eleven might demand it again in fifteen thirty nine seeing the effect of his words he added don't stay these young ones from making this journey of devotion the time may not be distant when there will be no such pilgrimage to make dame reynolds had quit her work her eyes on the priest's grave face god forbid it be as you say father but i'll try to find a way joan reappeared as the priest took leave and the two stepped to the door to see him mount his long legged gelding as he bade them good day dame reynolds noticed the blue-gray shadows creeping across the path why it's late joan i wonder what can be keeping your brother so long end of chapter three chapter four of a candle for our lady by regina victoria hunt this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese chapter four at the edge of the little elm-girdled hamlet of millo Jem slipped from his seat on the chestnut behind Richard Norris. "'There's the road, sirs,' and he pointed to the rough, unpaved way which served as a thoroughfare from London to York. It was traversed now, as the pale sun declined, by a motley procession of wayfarers, horsemen, single and by twos and threes, some obviously couriers for a great personage by their badges and livery and the pace at which they rode, some merchants in rich though sober garb, again there would be wagons drawn by farmers bound for or returning from a central market or great convoys such as wool on the road to dunstable and thence for the ports of flanders and then religious monks of st benedict in their black habits friars dominicans and franciscan these most often afoot their habits patched and soiled and canons well mounted and groomed bound for the chapter house of their cathedral we're obliged to you young man the squire said indeed so his nephew added smiling down at jem fishing in his wallet he drew out another silver piece oh no jem gently pushed away the preferred shilling but you've done us a great favor it's but just you receive some reward it's reward enough for me just to come this way with you i don't often escape from the farm and the work there jem patted the chestnut's nose affectionately good-bye barb then he bowed to the gentleman god go with you sirs and with you boy said mr norris if ever you come up to london richard added i hope you'll seek me out oh i should like to very much 
Jim watched them set spurs to their mounts and start off at a canter along the highway. London! What must it be like? The great metropolis sprawled over the banks of the Thames. With its churches and palaces and law courts and guilds, and the houses of parliament, and, overlooking, governing all, the court of the king. A little shiver of delight shook him as he turned back again on the country road, but soon he put the dream from him. After all, what remote possibility could ever take an impoverished midland yeoman like himself to London? All the same, the dream was attractive, and coming to a wooded spot on the bank of the Ree, Jim threw himself on a leaf-carpeted mound to consider it. Plucking a purply sprig of flowering rush, he idly watched the last of the summer swallows skim and dip into the surface of the murmuring stream. Suppose that one day he should recover, even add to the family prosperity. There were yeomen who had regular business in London. Why, Farmer Bailey up near Potton used to make the journey once or twice a year. But that was before the worst days had fallen on the farm folk. Even Farmer Bailey had had to lease and sell a great part of his holdings piecemeal, many acres going to the new sheep herders, including the weavers. Jim sprang up, dark brows drawn. Sheep herders. These were the men who now went to London, men who evicted poor tenants to make room for their pastures, men who got by every means more and more of their neighbor's land, and waxed richer as others grew poorer. Oh, yes, they went to London and sold their wool at high prices to be manufactured on the looms of Flanders, and they drank the best ale in taverns and bought luxuries for their wives and children, and could send their sons to Oxford or Cambridge if they chose. Though now, with the closing of so many monasteries, the grammar schools conducted by the monks would be fewer. As he strode along in the lengthening shadows, resentment seething against these men who were destroying all the fine fertile fields of England for their own profit, he saw the big, hulking figure of Ralph Weaver coming toward him. Ralph jeered at him. Well, what do I see? The young master avenger of Midland, yeomanry, retreating from market empty-handed? Or... Good evening, Ralph. Jim would have passed him, but Ralph shot out a long arm and caught him by the jerkin. Answer when your better speak to you. Jim watched him out of dark eyes, growing dangerous, but spoke no words. Poor Jem Reynolds! What'll you do when we take over the remainder of the farm? Better learn to herd sheep, boy. There'll be nothing else for a countryman like you. Ralph's teeth jarred together on the last word, locked by the swift, violent jolt of Jim's fist. His light eyes rolled like marbles. Then he swung out and landed a body blow that sent Jim backward onto the mud of the path around the common. But Jim was up in a second, and though he saw a rider coming, and guessed who he was, too, he struck at Ralph in red-hot fury. The blow missed, for a riding crop had descended on Jim's right arm, spoiling his aim. "'Now what's this?' demanded Father Ledhall. "'No friendly tussle, I warrant, by the looks of you.' "'Master Jim's too quick to anger, Father.' Ralph thrust his hands in his fleece coat pockets and grinned with false assurance. "'You should speak to him of it.' The priest thoughtfully stroked his chin. "'Ah, and what said you to provoke him?' Only a joke, father. Jim cut in. A joke, was it? A threat, rather, to make us landless. Peace, lads, both of you. There are evils enough and dangers enough in the land without quarrels and ill blood between neighbors. And you, Ralph, refrain from baiting one younger and less fortunate, if you would keep the friendship of God, whose command it is that we love one another. Ralph started to move off. Thanks for the advice, Father, but I never struck him before he had the first blow. Father Lethal dismounted and put a hand on Jim's shoulder. Is that true, son? Aye. Jim's smoldering eyes followed Ralph as he swung off down the road. The priest waited, but he would say no more. Provoked you by threats and taunts. Is that it? I never meet him, but he jeers at our poverty and threatens to reduce us to beggary. The fire died out of Jem's eyes, and he hung his head. The worst is, they may do just that. No, by God's merciful providence. Son, how would you like to perform a pilgrimage, say, to Our Lady of Walsingham? Jim looked up quickly. To Walsingham? I'd give anything to go, but Grandmother. I think she may have changed her mind today, son, but you must do your part. 
guard your temper when you meet the weavers, help all you can with the work of fields and garden. Oh, yes, father, to see Our Lady's shrine, to ask her help. He swallowed hard, almost choking over the sudden foretaste of happiness. In a kind of daze, he parted from the priest of the chantry, and arrived home so breathless and tassel-haired that his grandmother and Joan looked at him in some alarm. "'What on earth?' Joan began. "'Grandmother!' Jem panted. "'You've consented? To the pilgrimage? Father Ledhall says you have.' "'Well,' Dame Reynolds hesitated. "'Please, Grandmother!' Joan was eager, too. Dame Reynolds concealed the twinkle in her eyes. "'Well, I've been thinking we might make it at Easter tide, if we can find a suitable offering for Our Lady.' "'Easter!' Jem's face was radiant. "'Do you hear that, Joan?' And he caught his sister in a bear hug, and swung her round and round until, his foot catching on a rush mat, they went down together in a laughing heap on the floor. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of A Candle for Our Lady by Regina Victoria Hunt. The Slipperbox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Five A Suitable Offering. As days passed, then weeks, and the rust and gold of autumn gave place to winter's white with gray, low hanging skies, Jem and Joan searched their minds and juggled that problem. We've neither gold nor jewels, said Joan as they discussed the matter for the hundredth time. "'Nor amber, nor ivory,' added Jem. He dropped on the rush mat before the ruddy fire, while Joan sat sewing between the light of the flames and a dish of tallow behind her. "'You're sure, Grandmother, that you haven't another silver cup, like the one you and Grandfather took to the shrine?' "'No, Joan, it was the only one, given your grandfather by his mother, who had it from someone she had befriended in time of need.' Dame Reynolds pursed her lips in a little smile as she bent over her endless tasks, sewing, cooking, spinning, washing, thinking that she had been spared importunities about the pilgrimage while the two teased their minds over the offering. And perhaps when they did think of something practical, the pains that racked her would have lessened, or, well, surely the Blessed Mother would see to it that her infirmities need not hinder the youngster's plan. Right now you'd better give a little thought to the annual Christmas offering for the parish. That's easy, said Jem. One bushel of rye and two fat capons. But Christmas is a long time yet. Not so long. Tis the first week of Advent. Joan examined the scarlet homespun she was sewing. Wonder if I'll have my new dress finished. The remaining weeks sped swiftly. But with house cleaning... Not the thorough spring cleaning, but the moderate scrubbing and sweeping that preceded the high holidays, laying in logs for the hearth, roasting and baking, tending the three cows in the byre, the oxen and the chickens, the cold short days disappeared, and a round of work. Then, one frosty morning, Jim and Joan awoke to a peal of bells, proclaiming anew the birth of the infant Christ. Shivering, they scrambled into their best clothes, Joan in her gay-colored gown, Jim in a blue jerkin and gray trunk hose to join Dame Reynolds and Cousin Will in the ox-drawn cart. It was still dark as they jolted their way over the unpaved, snow-covered path. The embattled parapets and low stone spire of All Saints Church looked ghostly as a cloud castle in their setting of white-sheathed lime trees. Inside the fourteenth-century nave was filled to the last inch of standing room. With a choir chanting, Gloria and Excelsis Deo, the altar decked with yew and holly and a blaze of tapers, the priests in their finest vestments embroidered with gold and silk, and the mixed scent of wax, myrrh, and balsam in the air, it was all real enough. Indeed, it was the most real thing in their lives that the great God should manifest himself over and over again on the altar of their own humble parish church, removed so many centuries and by such a distance from his earthly home in heaven. The sheer beauty and joy of it brought a mist of tears to Joan's eyes. It was after the communion prayers that she saw something that caught her imagination— at the end of the last gospel, she turned quickly and prodded Jim. Look, she whispered. Jim looked at the procession, reforming to leave the sanctuary. An acolyte bearing a large satiny taper and a massive silver candlestick was in the lead. There is our offering, Joan said with conviction. A taper for Our Lady. The momentary doubt on Jim's face changed in an instant to a smile of approval. 
Just the thing, he exclaimed under his breath. They held their secret like a treasure on the homeward journey, but once under the gabled roof of the farmhouse, their excitement bubbled over. One at a time, please. Dame Reynolds was removing the roast capons from the skewers. I can't hear either of you when you talk at once. Now, what about the taper? For an offering, Grandmother, to take to Our Lady's Shrine. She regarded their shining faces and slowly considered. A taper? Like the one used in the procession at Mass this morning, over two feet high and round as an apple. Aye, it would be a handsome offering. But children, that's no ordinary tallow and rush candle. Her knotted hand gestured to the table where their own best yellow hand-dipped candles smoked in plain wooden holders. We know, Grandmother, Jim assured her eagerly, it's beeswax. And so fitting to give Our Lady, Joan added, so firm and glistening and sweet-smelling. But how, think you, girl, do poor people like us afford such a luxury? For a moment the pair looked at each other, their faces blank. It was true, of course. Tapers like that were of expensive materials and skilled workmanship. Jim was first with an idea. I know, we'll make it ourselves. That way, it will be truly our own gift to Our Lady. Why, of course, said Joan. I know how to tip wicks. Well, their grandmother began to see a way. If you can bring together all we shall need, the beeswax, the proper kind of wick. Oh, we will, we will, grandmother. The old lady looked on their flushed, happy faces and smiled, forgetful of her own rheumatic pains. Then I will help you fashion a fine candle for Our Lady. She looked up as the door opened. Here is Cousin Will, so to table with you, for this is the blessed feast of Christmas. Let us make merry with a glad heart and God's peace with us all. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of A Candle for Our Lady by Regina Victoria Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Six. Jem trudged through the snow, hands thrust deep in fleece lined pockets to keep them from freezing. It was the third week in Epiphany, and a bitter winter had settled down over the Midlands with a hard frost and steel skies. With Shag at his heels, he made what haste he could for Grandmother Reynolds was ill, so ill that her life was in danger. Why didn't we see her sickness sooner? He reproached himself, thinking of the long cold nights the old lady had bent over the melting wax for their precious candle. To be sure, he and Joan had worked too. She had prepared the stranded flax wick. He had procured the wax, two pounds of choice honeycomb, in exchange for extra service to the parish and together they had raked together the necessary utensils, an ancient copper kettle in which to melt the wax, a handmade frame for dipping the wick. Then came the endless dippings and hardenings and more dippings. But it was Grandmother who, after all her other tasks, worked longest and latest, bending over the kettle on the hearth after Jim and Joan had climbed, heavy-lidded, with weariness, to their loft bedroom. Until three days ago, then she had developed such a cough, in addition to her rheumatism, that they had insisted she take to her bed. Joan had tended her with all the remedies they knew, herbs and simples from their own little garden carefully brewed and steeped, but she had grown steadily worse. This morning there had been a family consultation, and the three, Cousin Will, Joan, and himself, decided the village leech must be sent for. If only he can cure her! Jim was wondering what any of them would do without Grandmother. Even you, Shag. He looked at the dog who had loped some paces ahead. Now he had stopped and was sniffing at something lying in the shadow of the hedge, bounding the common. Come, Shag, we must hurry. But the dog was burrowing under the new-fallen snow, uncovering a partly buried object. Jim drew in his breath sharply. It was a man. Slowly pulled back to awareness by the dog's frantic movements, the man stirred and sat up. Must have fallen asleep. His eyes blinked against the icy whiteness. Where am I? Iworth. Jim supposed the stranger to be one of the many baggers or vagabonds that the religious and social changes had loosed upon the country. Where were you going? He helped the man to his feet, noting that he was sturdy and quite young, despite many days' growth of beard in his patched mendicant dress. 
The other smiled wanly. Any place will do. Anywhere an outcast son of St. Francis may obtain a day's work and a crust of bread. Jem backed off. A friar? Aye, son, Peter's my name, but it's not as you think. I'm no renegade. Our house and community at Bedford was suppressed by the king's orders. Last October it was sold to one of his grace's creatures, and we returned into the world to fare as we may. If you know any... Jem gripped the friar's arm. Come with me. I'll take you to the chantry yonder. Father Ledhall shall feed and warm you. Perhaps, too, we can think of something you can do. I know Cousin Will could use another man on the farm. You are most kind, said the young friar. How can I thank you? Not me, sir. Thank Shag here. He found you. Indeed I do, the friar replied, stroking Shag, who on his part seemed to have taken an immediate fancy to his discovery in the snow. I could not be a true son of St. Francis if I failed to share his love for all God's creatures. On reaching the wayside chapel or chantry, Jim hurriedly told Father Lethal Friar Peter's story. Then he pulled on his cap. I must go. It's grandmother. She's worse? asked Father Lethal. Ay, Father, I'm getting the leech. I shall pray for her, said Friar Peter. And I, my son, the priest added, his gaze grave. Out into the white cold, Jem hurried again, Shag looking beside him. In the village, in a street at right angle to the marketplace, Jem found the leech, a little bald-headed man with peering eyes. He hustled to his horse and put Jem on behind to direct him to the farmhouse. When Joan opened the door, the first thing that met their eyes was a taper. It stood, a dazzling wax calm, on the board table away from the fire. Jim gasped in delight. How beautiful! She wanted to see it, Joan said, glancing toward the bedroom. She dabbed at her eyes, red-rimmed in her pale face. I'm so glad we did it, Jim, for her. Though, now, of course, we won't be going to Walsingham. Jim felt a tight twist at his heart. You mean... Father Ledhall came from the bedroom. He motioned the leech inside, then closed the door behind him. I thought I'd better come at once, son. I knew she would want the sacraments. But wait. Jim was going in, but the priest restrained him. She'll see you both when the leech has finished. It wasn't long, though it seemed an age, until the little doctor appeared, shaking his head in answer to the question in their eyes. Guided by the priest, the pair went up to the curtained bed and looked down on their grandmother's wasted face. The brown eyes still had a flicker of their wonted courage and good humor. So, children, she murmured, it seems God wants me to go on a longer journey than Walsingham. Nay, nay, is it a matter for tears? But look you at yon taper. Isn't it a beauty? More beautiful than I hoped, said Jem hoarsely. Thanks to you, Grandmother, Joan added, pressing one of the old, worn hands. Well, I, I'm glad I could see it finished. Now make me a promise. Anything, Grandmother. That you'll make this pilgrimage to Walsingham. Without you? Make it at Easter, and there offer this our taper to Our Lady for my happy repose. You'll do it, children? Of course, Grandmother they whispered with bent heads, holding back the tears. She folded her hands contentedly over the blanket. Thank you, children. Our taper. Her lips smiled gently. To what looks so beautiful, even among all the lights of Walsingham. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of A Candle for Our Lady by Regina Victoria Hunt this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 7 Joan eyed the unfamiliar woodland doubtfully. Jem, are you sure of the road? Of course. Jem swung the knapsack carrying their small provisions and the precious taper over his shoulders. The carter who set us down yonder said Ermine Street lay due east. Well, there's the sun behind us. He said nothing of forest, though. 
To Joan the track seemed to wind endlessly under interlocked branches of ancient elms and oaks. However, seeing Jem going forward with confident stride, she followed, thinking how the days had flown since they had said good-bye to the farm and Cousin Will, Father Ledhall, Friar Peter, and Shag. They were minded to take Shag, but decided against it, as they could scarcely carry provisions for themselves. Then, too, he was needed on the farm, where Friar Peter had agreed to stay and help with the spring sowing, so as to release Jim for the pilgrimage. For the first few days after crossing into Cambridgeshire, they had followed the simple directions given them by Cousin Will. But now, in the eastern half of the unfamiliar county, they had to depend on local information, sometimes vague and sometimes contradictory. Occasionally, as today, they had been given a lift of several miles by farmer or travelling tradesman. Yet more of the time they had gone afoot, and not always as now, with a carpet of moss under their road-worn feet. But with the scent of spring in the air, the pink and white foam of apple and cherry blossoms spilling over the roadway, Cuckoo and Robin joyously heralding the season, they scarcely noticed weariness or the passage of days. "'It's growing dusk,' said Joan presently. "'We're bound to meet someone soon.' And a few minutes later, "'Ah, see, what did I tell you?' Jim pointed to the figure of a man slouched in the shadow of a great oak. Quickening his steps, he called out, "'Can you tell us, is this Ermine Street?' "'Aye, so tis,' returned the stranger in their own Midland speech. Not really old, but shabbily dressed and unshaven, he squinted up at them. "'You be strangers?' "'We're from Eyeworth and Bedford, bound for Our Lady's Shrine at Walsingham.' "'Pilgrims, eh?' The man rose, and a little gleam entered his eye. "'Then we're well met. I'm so bound myself.' "'Good!' Jim turned to Joan, his eyes a-sparkle. Didn't I say we'd meet fellow pilgrims? You're the first, Joan said to the stranger as they trudged along the rough, twisting path. This was the famed road that Roman legionaries had hewed through the dense forest more than a thousand years before. That be like enough, their guide replied, with a side glance at the sack Jim carried. Seeing the changes in the kingdom. Now we'll take this turn off to the left and he led them down a by-path where the forest grew even denser and darker. Joan shivered. Glancing upward, she caught just a tiny gleam of starlight through the roof of tightly laced branches. Why, tis night already. Aye, said their guide, but we can rest safe enough in a bower until morning. I have no provisions left myself, but... He looked at the knapsack Jem set down. We'll gladly share with you, Jem offered though we've only black bread, some dry meal, and salt pork. Meat was permitted, he knew, to all making a pilgrimage, as well as to the poor during Lent. Eh, the man seemed disappointed. From the weight you carried, I thought you must have a side o' ham or haunch o' venison. Oh, that's the candle. Candle, eh? The pure wax taper we're going to offer Our Lady. Jim moved his hand reverently over the wrapper. For our dead grandmother. Joan said. She and we made it when we thought she could make the pilgrimage too. But... She choked a moment remembering Grandmother Reynolds. She took sick and died. A shame, a sorry shame. The old man continued munching the dry pork and coarse bread ravenously. But that's the way of the world, lass. Here today, gone tomorrow. Well, we'll lie here, shall we? Making a bower of branches, Jem and Joan threw themselves on a bed of moss, the knapsack between them, and slipped quickly into a slumber so deep it seemed like falling into the bottom of a well. A night hawk's piercing call made Jem roll over and rub his eyes. The air was chill, it was still dark. He was about to drop off again, when automatically he felt for the sack. His hand touched vacantly, and beyond that the sleeping girl. Gone! As the thought struck him, his heart missed a beat. He felt the other side. Nothing. Joan, he cried, shaking her. Wake up. What, what is it? Joan asked from the depths of a great yawn. The sack with our taper, it's gone. Gone? She too was wide awake now. And our guide? Aye, Jim kicked at the pallet of leaves and moss their companion had occupied. Fools we were to trust him. But, said Joan, scrambling to her feet, he can't have gone far in this darkness. Jem stiffened. 
You're right, Joan. We'll overtake the knave. Come. They stumbled on blindly in the direction the stranger had led them, but no sign of him. Gnarled branches reached out, catching like fingers at their hair and clothing. Long, springy ferns crept up to trip them. All around them were the little eerie sounds of the forest, the rustlings of small animals, the thin, penetrating notes of night birds. Once Joan felt her face brushed by wings and cried out, grasping her brother's arm with both hands. Only a bat, he said a bit breathlessly. Used as they were to country sounds, those of the forest were different, an unexplored mystery. They had heard the legends of gnomes and giants, of witches' spells and of fire-breathing monsters. Who could tell what lurked about among these ancient trees? At last Jem saw a little clearing ahead. He made toward it at a run. What is it? Joan asked, catching up with him. We'll see. There may be someone, some dwelling. He stopped short. In the paling darkness, a group of ragged figures crouched around a low-burning fire. Two of them rose, their fierce eyes fastened on the young intruders. Jem saw the gleam of knives in their hands as they strode toward them. Outlaws, Joan! Instinctively he flung himself in front of his sister, prepared for the end. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of A Candle for Our Lady by Regina Victoria Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Eight. Dear Lady of Walsingham, whispered Joan, deliver us. One of the roughs seized Jim, hauling him before the group around the fire. A tall man, apparently the leader, rose and looked at Jim, then laughed boisterously. What have you there, Tom? Tis a beardless boy, and a girl. Ha! Please don't harm my brother, Joan cried, running to the leader and clinging to his arm. We meant no ill to any one. Nay, nay, calm your fears. Release the lad, Tom. And now, suppose you tell us how you young ones happened to penetrate this lair of broken, masterless men. We were pursuing a thief. Jim had recovered his breath. His glance went round the group, half expecting to see their erstwhile fellow pilgrim, but the ruddy glare of the fire failed to reveal the man with a squint. He had led us down a byway from Ermine Street, Joan said, and in the night stole away with our provisions and our precious taper. Taper? The leader stroked his bearded chin thoughtfully. Aye, the one we had made for Our Lady's shrine, said Jim. He knew this and... Sacrilegious fellow! The tall man was indignant. To steal from God. Can we wonder, Rob, came a gentler voice from the other side of the fire, when the royal lion rends the house and the servants of God, we may expect the jackals to follow. Aye, Brother Dominic, you say well. Make a place for our young guests, lads. Day's breaking, and we may as well break our fast. Gratefully the pair accepted, not quite knowing into what company they had stumbled. But as they breakfasted on wild game, crudely roasted over the open fire, they learned that most of the men were tenant farmers evicted by force or fraud from their holdings. Knowing no trade, they had been driven to take refuge in the woods, where they lived as they might by poaching and squatting. Under his breath, Jem said, and this is what the weavers would bring us to. Rob, a roughly genial man with a shock of red golden hair, was speaking. Maybe you're wondering what Brother Dominic is doing among us lawbreakers. Tell him, brother. The young brother smiled. I, too, am a lawbreaker, though not willingly. I was, and am, a monk of the Order of St. Benedict, whom it has pleased the King's grace to cast back, penniless, into the world. Against your will, brother? Joan asked, her gray eyes wide. I, for by decree of King Henry, those religious under the age of twenty-three, whom he deemed too numerous for the community, can be forcibly ejected. Of such was I. Like Friar Peter, said Jem. There are many such. You've heard of the pilgrimage of grace? Of how the northern folk rose to petition the king to restore the monasteries? Jem remembered the Norrises and their talk of the pilgrimage, and would have succeeded but for the treachery of the king's council. Alack for us poor men that they did not, said Rob. In the old days when the monasteries flourished, no honest man was reduced to our condition. For there, as the song goes, the folk had, 
both ale and bread at time of need and succor great in all distress. Careful, Rob, the one called Tom warned. That ballad was sung by the Pilgrims of Grace. Should you be overheard, it could be a hanging matter. Rob laughed. You might be right, Tom, but they'll have to catch me first. Jim felt himself warming toward these men. Rob with his untamed ruby mane and hearty laugh. The gentle brother Dominic, even the black-visaged Tom. He would have gladly tarried longer among them, but by now the sun had broken through dark, struggling masses of cloud, streaking the eastern horizon with peach. Expressing their thanks for the hospitality shown them, Jim and Joan rose. We must be on the road. We still to seek our taper. It's like the scoundrel will sell it, Rob advised them, so watch all markets you pass on the way. Furnished with directions to the crossing of the house, they were cheered on their way. And when you come to Our Lady, commend us to her, said Brother Dominic. They took the path through the woods, alive with the song of mating birds and the murmur of little streams. The morning sun struck lance points through the tangle of interwoven branches, discovering white anemones and white and purple violets peeping through the moss, touching budding leaves to a green transparent fire. Refreshed and their hunger appeased, they pressed on mile after mile. Breathing deeply of the clear, fragrant air and keenly aware of the beauties around them, but still with a sense of urgency, but no sign of the thief. If only we'd taken Shag, the fellow would never have gotten away with it. And, Jem, even if he had, Shag would have guided us to him. Jem stared straight ahead, his eyes sad. I'm afraid we'll never recover the taper. Remember what the man Rob said? To watch at market towns. We've not come to any towns yet. Aye, but by the time we do, he could have sold ten candles and disappeared. Without the candle, we've no offering for Our Lady. Dare we go to her shrine empty-handed? Jim lifted his head, his dark eyes seeing something beyond the green girdled path. Yes, Joan, for you see, it's really ourselves we're offering. Father Ledhall told us that. And Grandmother. The taper stands for us, for our love for Our Lady, for the sake of her son, our blessed Lord. It was so beautiful. Joan was close to tears. And we all worked so hard to make it, especially Grandmother. And she wanted it to grace the shrine for her repose. Well, we'll make the pilgrimage and offer our prayers for her. For her and for us and for... Jim looked about at the glories of the Springfield Forest. For this dear ancient land, Our Lady's dowry. It was past noonday when they reached the crossing of the Ouse and came by ferry into the marshland of the Fens its watery surface reflecting violet-lined clouds of the wide low sky as in a mirror. Making their way through the unknown Norfolk town, Jim turned over the few remaining pennies in his wallet. The fairy took most of our money, Joan. We'll have to bag our... Jim! Joan tugged at his sleeve. Look! That man talking with the dealer in the market! It's him! He's showing the candle! Jim looked in the direction of the hucksters and housewives crowded around the market stalls. The next second he was in full motion, crying out, Thief! That's our blessed taper! The man with the squint took to his heels, clutching the candle. But Jim kept him in view, Joan following with the crowd, all crying, Stop! Thief! In and out of the winding streets, through an alley, between houses with overhanging gables, and down an embankment of slippery peat land, Jim pursued his quarry. The fellow was nimble, no question of that. Time and again Jim was within inches of laying hold of him, only to see him slip away like an eel. But, at last, thanks to his youth, Jim overtook him on the edge of the reed-fringed lake. "'Give me the candle!' he panted, shaking him by the collar. The wretch, apparently thinking he would escape punishment by destroying the evidence, hurled the taper in its wrappings toward the lake. Jim pushed him aside and flew down the treacherous bank, his heart thudding in fear that the candle had sunk below the surface." But no, there it was, parted from its wrapper, gleaming against the bed of mud. To reach it, he would have to wade through slime to his knees. He plunged in, unheeding the warning cries from the bank. Beware the marsh, lad! Slipping, almost falling, Jim reached the spot and gathered the precious taper up in his arms once more. Presently hands were extended to help him back to solid ground. He saw the thief taken in tow from among the knot of townsfolk by a constable, and he heard Joan say, 
Oh, Jem, that was a dangerous thing. You might have been sucked down, suffocated in that horrible mud. Anyway, he gasped, clutching the taper, we recovered our candle for Our Lady. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of A Candle for Our Lady by Regina Victoria Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Nine. Turning from the vast Roman Norman citadel of Castle Acre, with its stone keep and embattled towers swathed in mist, Jim and Joan struck out along the green way to the right. Ancient, pre Roman peddlers' way lay inviting a few miles north. But that, they were told, they some miles west of Fakenham, where they would find Palmer's Way, the usual route from the south to Walsingham. How long they had been on the road they could not have said, through forest and fen, over the wild sandy heaths of Norfolk, Reckland, carpeted now with rosy heather, they had come in sunshine, wind, and rain, tramping, too, most of the way, with only an occasional lift in a farmer's jogging cart. But this was Holy Saturday, and they were nearing their goal. Their greatest concern at the moment was food. Haven't you a penny left, Jim? Not one, Joan. Jim shook his empty wallet. But we're coming into wooded country again. There'll be wild nuts and berries, at least. Ugh, they're sour. Well, this is Lent still, so a little added fasting will be a merit. And then we did have one meal yesterday at the monastery back yonder. A boiled egg for each and some rather moldy bread. What was the matter, Jim? That wasn't the poor monastery. Jim shook his head. I don't know. Perhaps tis one of those we've heard about that has submitted to the king. Aye, that must be it. For you saw how little they liked our mention of the pilgrimage. One of the monks would have told us something. But was silenced by the father superior. Jim reflected on the cold, inhospitable atmosphere of that community. How different from the reception given pilgrims when their grandparents went to Walsingham. But twill be all right, Joan. Jim spoke with more confidence than he felt. Once we get on Palmer's way, we'll meet other pilgrims. Then when we come to Walsingham, remember what Grandmother told us, how the pilgrims were welcomed and feasted by the Austin canons who guard the sanctuary. Cheered by the prospect of anticipated comforts, Joan plucked up courage to endure present hardships and tried to ignore the pangs of hunger. But as the day dragged on into dusk, accompanied by a heavy drizzle, Hunger relieved only by a handful of hazelnuts and some wild berries, as sour as Joan had predicted. Both their spirits sank. Jem stood on a small knoll. There is a town over yonder, he said. Must be faking him. I can't walk another foot tonight, said Joan, sinking down against a tree trunk. All right, we'll shift as we can. Come, I'll build us a bower off the roadside. Chilled and foodless as they were, they crept into the shelter of the interlaced boughs, and, the precious taper lay between them, soon fell sound asleep. Jim was awakened by Joan's cries. He started up, seeing that it was day. Also, that it was raining. "'We'll be drenched to the skin if we walk in this,' said Joan, pulling the warm blue hood over her brown curls. Jim laughed. "'What's a little rain?' A little rain? Why, it's falling in sheets. Only a shower. But Jem saw dark rain clouds banked against the horizon, and knew they might be caught in a downpour. He coaxed her to hurry, and before another hour ran out, they had passed back in Ham's gabled houses and sprinkling of chimneys to enter leafy Palmer's Way. Here they met a solitary pilgrim, a middle-aged man wearing an ancient russet gown and carrying a gnarled staff. Sir, Jim hailed him, can you direct us to an inn? Joan, my sister, is nigh starving from our long pilgrimage. An inn? The stranger surveyed them out of keen blue eyes. There's one at Uton in the Dale. I'll bear you company, if you will. Jem thanked him, but he saw Joan casting suspicious glances at their new companion as they walked in the wet dawn. You spoke of a pilgrimage. Are you for Walsingham? Aye, sir, said Jem. We intend to be there for Mass on this feast of our Lord's resurrection. And to pray for our grandmother's repose, Joan added, careful not to mention the candle which was now the sole content of the sack Jem carried. At the shrine? The stranger stroked his square-cut chin. 
News travels slow. You've come quite a distance from your speech. Jim made little of the stranger's muttered comment. From Iworth and Bedford. We've come across Cambridgeshire and Norfolk. He answered Joan's signs and grimaces with a slight shake of the head. If their acquaintance was other than he seemed, they would in any case soon be quit of him. On reaching Euton, in fact, he indicated the inn standing near the delicately spired slipper chapel, and courteously bade them good day. Jim drew Joan into the walled courtyard and then into the common room of the inn. A handful of early patrons turned to stare at the bedraggled pair. Jim set his eyes on the host, a burly, bald-headed man wrapped around with an enormous apron. Out with you, he bawled, waving huge hands. No beggars or vagrants here. Jim stood his ground. We are neither, but pilgrims to Our Lady's Shrine. We've journeyed across two counties afoot to attend Easter Mass. Pilgrims? To Walsingham? The host's laugh was like a bellow, echoed by the others, who guffawed and slapped their knees. But a covetous gleam shone in the innkeeper's eye. Why, now, if you're pilgrims, you'll have brought gifts, surely. What have you in that knapsack? A candle, Jim replied shortly, stung by the laughter. A candle? Let's have a look. And the big man pulled the sack open, drawing out the glistening taper. Mary, pure wax and over two pound weight. I make you an offer, boy. Breakfast for you both in exchange for this candle. Thanks, said Jem coldly, withdrawing the candle, but this is for Our Lady. The innkeeper used a wheedling tone. It's a fair offer, young master. Good day, said Jem. Come, Joan. He turned to see the man in the mendicant's gown, watching the scene from the open door, but he had vanished when they came out. We'll go yonder to the chapel, Joan, and take off our shoes, as pilgrims are wont to do. Though men have altered in these parts since our grandparents' day, we'll honor Our Lady in the old way. In the dim light of the little chapel, with its exquisite wood carvings and colored rood screen, they put off their worn, mud-cake shoes. After resting a few minutes, they trudged on, carrying their shoes. Jim stopped now and then to gather marigolds and bluebells to make a nosegay for Our Lady. The promised rainstorm had not come, and the day was clearing as they entered Walsingham. Their spirits soared like skylarks winging above them. Look! Jen pointed to the famous arch of the Augustinian Priory, standing far above the low roofs of the small town. That must be it! Jim hurried Joan along. Well, we've not had the entertainments on the way that our elders had, but we're here, and we've kept our vow. And should have all the more merit for the hardships we've encountered. Jen pulled the faded hood over her head. But where... Where is everyone? Are we late? I, why, I don't know. And as they reached the priory, Jim stood aghast. Shattered walls, a heap of rubble, roofs stripped of lead, stared at them. Desolation hung over the half-demolished priory. There was no sign of the cannons in their black hoods. As for the chapel, where was it? They ran round one side and the other of the awful ruin. No trace. Nothing to tell them that Our Lady's Shrine had ever stood there. But, Joan argued, it can't have just disappeared. Despairingly, Jim turned to her, then saw the brown-clad mendicant approaching. Good sir, he said, what has happened? Isn't this Walsingham Church and Priory? Isn't it Our Lady's Shrine? End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of A Candle for Our Lady by Regina Victoria Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Ten. The stranger nodded slowly, lifting his eyes to the jagged stone of the ruined gateway. So it was, I, for near four hundred years, until a year ago. Then the king's officers came. They stripped lead from the roof, turned out the cannons, hanged the protesting sub-prior, and sent Our Lady's image to be burned below the gallows tree at Tyburn. He laid a strong hand on the boy's shoulder, for Jim had gone white as paper. Joan dropped on the stone of the church porch and wept, her bouquet of spring flowers falling unheeded into a puddle at her feet. Lad, the stranger said, you've a right good spirit, 
I heard you refuse yon churl innkeeper the blessed taper. "'Twas our grandmother's dying request, she said. It will look so beautiful amid the lights of Walsingham. But now... Jim turned his stricken gaze on the ruin. "'Well, you had a good intention, and since you've come so far, you're surely in need of refreshment.' Taking Jim by the shoulders, he turned him around. "'See that manor about a quarter mile distant? Go thither and ask for Sir William Waltham.' With that, he turned and strode away so fast they could ask no further questions. For a long moment they stared at each other in stunned silence. "'I suppose,' Joan said at last, "'we may as well seek this Sir William.' To be turned off as we were by the innkeeper, or to receive the cold charity of those monks? Maybe not, Jem. This mendicant, whoever he is, seems to know these parts well. Anyway, what else can we do? So they put on their scuff shoes and set off in the direction the stranger had indicated, soon coming to an unfortified manor house set in a stately park of elms and oak. With steps that dragged over the gravel path, they approached the brass-studded door and raised the heavy knocker. An old, timid-looking porter answered the summons. "'Sir William Waltham?' Jim asked. "'We were told to seek him here.' The porter scratched his head, but motioned them to enter. From the reception hall they were admitted into a fine, oak-beamed room with mullioned windows facing the court. A large tapestry showing St. George slaying the dragon worked in deep reds and blues, masked one side of the wall. Elsewhere were stands of arms, swords, helms, and shields. Glancing round, they stood in their wet and torn garments before the log fire that burned cheerily under the bulging chimney breast, carved with the knight's armorial bearings. De Ajavante Montemendum, Jem read the motto scroll. What does it mean? Joan asked. Something like, God helping, there is nothing to fear. They exchanged glances, for the motto seemed to fit their own case. A door at the far end of the hall opened, and a man's deep voice spoke. Now, can I help you, fellow pilgrims? They looked at him, seeing a stalwart man in the late forties, clad in a rich doublet of blue velvet, wearing long grey hose and carrying a knightly sword, by an embossed leather belt. Iron grey hair, worn short and crisply waved, topped a face that might have appeared stern, but for the twinkle in the vivid blue eyes, the twitching smile of the firm-set lips. Jim and Joan looked and looked again. Sir William? But, but you are... Sir William laughed. I, I'm your roadside guide. I have my reasons for disguise, as you shall see. Now will you hear Mass in my chapel before breaking your long fast? Mass, they whispered, eyes shining like lighted tapers in their wet faces. He led them through a dim corridor and up a short flight of steps, then thrust aside tapestry curtains. As in a dream, they saw the altar decked with lights and flowers, the priest, Sir William's chaplain, in his white and gold mass vestments. Then their wonder-struck eyes focused on the wood-carved image on the gospel side, the Blessed Virgin clasping the infant Jesus in one arm, and the other hand holding a lily scepter. Our Lady, they breathed, thrilled to the heart, our Lady of Walsingham. Instinctively, Jim pulled out the blessed taper. At a sign from Sir William, the chaplain took it, lighted it, and placed it before the shrine. In wordless joy, Jim and Joan saw the tiny flame expand and bloom like a luminous flower. Sinking to their knees, they prayed long and fervently for their grandmother. But how did it come to be here? Didn't you say it was burned at Tyburn in London? Tis a copy, of course the knight explained over breakfast in his chamber, overlooking a bright blooming flower garden. My ancestors had it made for our chapel. Little they guessed that in our day the original would be carted off and destroyed, the pious offerings to Our Lady swept into the royal coffers. But the king! Jim was shocked and bewildered by this revelation. King Henry, who has himself made the pilgrimage. Aye, lad, no man could have credited of Henry Tudor in times past. Barefoot he walked in dead of winter, from East Barsham yonder, to pray for Our Lady's intercession. Now he, or his minister, the upstart money-changer Thomas Cromwell, has destroyed it all, and sold the site to Cromwell's creature, Sidney, for ninety pounds. Joan looked up from her bowl of strawberries and rich cream. One thing, Sir William, I don't yet understand. 
you knew how things stand yet we met you on palmer's way a smile lighted sir william's handsome face true well miss joan since i was a lad younger than you once a year on some high feast i walked the palmer's way to our lady's shrine in those days of course twas thronged with pilgrims from all over britain and many from the continent he shook his head sadly times may change man's laws change but i cannot so change neither for fear nor favor this he added as to himself and then more briskly i wanted to see if there were others who despite the destruction and the terror would have the hardihood to pay honor to our lady at her most venerable shrine and were there others only you two youngsters but that is well for age remembers the past but youth builds for the future sir william rose and walked about the paneled chamber ay dark days have come on england but we won't despair as long as there are two young ones holding aloft a lighted taper End of chapter 10Chapter 11 of A Candle for Our Lady by Regina Victoria Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 11 Jem stretched and yawned between lavender scented sheets. Where was he? Spring sunlight filtered through the half open shutter, dappling the clean, wainscoted room. He came fully awake, remembering. Why, they were at Waltham Manor, had been these three days past domicile with reeves sir william steward a glow of youth and health went through him he sprang from bed and doused face and hands in cold water from the earthen bowl on a stand how good it had been these days following the accomplishment of their mission it seemed as if our lady of walsingham wanted to acknowledge the honour he and joan had paid her and to reward them for the hardships of the pilgrimage by the comfort and hospitality offered by sir william joan where was she oh yes she slept with reeve's amber-haired daughter isabel and no sooner the thought than a knock at the door jem it's me joan i have the new suit for you admit it she thrust the clothes into his arms isabel hopes they'll fit they belong to a groom who has outgrown them together we altered them but isabel did most of it present her my thanks jem said flinging on the linen shirt joan laughed present them yourself and she whisked away jim grinned as he struggled into the long hose and blue doublet then smoothed the unruly black waves in his hair soon he was starting out to them as they lingered over breakfast in the kitchen unlike their own at home the steward's house boasted a separate kitchen furnished with a fireplace and a table flanked by benches and opened into a fair garden of greens and blooms isabel reeves tilted her heart-shaped face to one side as she surveyed jem how well it looks many thanks miss isabel jem flushed under her admiring regard unused to the society of girls other than joan he was shy in their presence but there was something so warmly friendly and charming about this slim lass his own age that a keen sense of pleasure mingled with his embarrassment i'm indebted to you for replacing yon rags joan spread out the folds of a clean gray dress which had been Isabel's, with this touch of crisp white at collar and cuffs. What a sight we both were! It's a wonder Sir William's porter received us, in spite of his master's orders. But you were pilgrims, said Isabel, a note of awe in her voice. Any one should be able to see the difference between pilgrims and mere vagabonds. Oh! She glanced out the window. There's someone from the manor. Help yourself to breakfast, Jem. She ran out, light-footed as a deer. Jim needed no urging to lighten to the cold mutton and jelly, the fresh light bread and creamy butter set before him. But he had swallowed only a few mouthfuls before Isabel was back. You're both to go to the manor. Sir William wants to see you. Arrived at the big house, they found Sir William in his chamber. He was pacing the floor thoughtfully, a parchment scroll in one hand. Ah, come in, come in, you two. Reeves and his daughter have treated you well. Very hospitably, sir jim wondered what was in the knight's mind good i want you to know you're welcome to remain for an indefinite time it's most generous of you sir william but in truth we must prepare for our return shortly our kinsman is hard pressed for labor on the farm and if we have not a fair harvest this year jim broke off remembrance of the weaver's threats darkened his eyes 
you're in fear of these sheep herders ay so tis up and down the land sheep devouring men as that great-hearted statesman sir thomas more foresaw many years ago and now the state devouring the church spilling the noblest blood among us the pilgrims of grace the london carthusians saintly bishop fisher more himself dark days have come upon england our lady's fair dowry yet england can't be lost when there are knights strong and true as yourself sir thank you for that young man a shadowy smile appeared on sir william's firm set lips but i have no heir my dear gracious lady died five years ago we had no surviving children waltham and my other manners when i die revert either to the duke of norfolk my feudal lord or to the crown but while i live i'll do what i can he unrolled the parchment do you read latin lad very little sir well this is a document set out in full legal form it states that i confer on you and your sister a lifetime annuity of one hundred pounds each his keen blue eyes observed their astonished faces over the parchment do you understand what that means jim could not help stammering oh yes yes sir but why called an offering lad a votive offering to our lady coupled with a petition that loyalty to god and his church such as you two have shown may not vanish from our land jim and joan stared at the knight then at each other in wordless joy and gratitude how swiftly and generously our lady had rewarded them for the hardships and perils and disappointments of their pilgrimage then into the golden quiet came a shattering brutal violence horses reined up sharply in the court loud voices shouting calling sir william who what is it the knight demanded of the frightened old porter as he stirred into the hall jim and joan quickly followed mr thomas sidney sir william the quavering retainer was thrust aside by a lean thin-lipped man sir william a rabble of your people are down yonder at walsingham they're hindering my workmen in the future desecration of walsingham shrine spare your irony sir william it's now my property i've a right to build on it house or barn whatever i choose jem stared at thomas sidney with his tight lips and insolent air one of the new men of whom he had heard so much and anger red hot and boiling stirred in him none will dispute your legal title mr sidney sir william replied i believe you paid the lord cromwell all of ninety pounds for it but i warned you that the popular veneration superstitious nonsense and if the king's council hears of this threats are needless sir william girded on his sword if my people are involved i'll gladly support you in quelling disorder have my horse saddled and brought around then he told a servant but jem hearing the order flew from the hall and round to the stables one thought burned in his mind if sir william was embroiled in this riot at the shrine he must share the danger flinging a command to the astonished groom to saddle the knight's horse he himself quickly readied a young black gelding within minutes the party headed by sir william was moving out of the gravel courtyard jim had a glimpse of joan and isabel among those on the steps his sister's face grave with misgiving but isabel's gaily smiling the last he saw of them was isabel's kerchief waving encouragement the smile the gesture were to jim like two tokens bestowed in olden days by young ladies on their favourite aspirants to knighthood as they entered the narrow winding streets of walsingham parva jim saw a great crowd gathering about the desolate priory sydney was there already exhorting his workmen to proceed with their excavations but the throng men women even some children all hooting and yelling seized the workmen's tools and filled in the earth vowing no profane building should rise on the sacred soil of walsingham sir william's voice rang out hold good people of walsingham hear me not if you be with this this desecrator one man pointed to sydney and others echoed his cry in a moment the crowd had gathered compactly all round the site they mean to rush the works said sydney from the comparative safety of a mound of debris sir william made no reply but jem saw the firm purpose in his steady glance and held himself ready to follow his move in a second the knight had spurred straight into the angry throng his sword drawn knocking up clubs and cudgels but sydney's men 
driving in, drew answering fire from those on the opposite side, and the air was black with missiles. Wildly inflamed, Jim rushed in next to Sir William, just in time to intercept a large stone from the quarry of the ruined chapel. As this was his first, so it was to be his last feat that day. Struck full on the temple, he was aware of a great crash in his head, a blur of red and black in which the only distinct thing was Sir William's stalwart figure commanding order. Then the blackness closed in, shutting out the silver of the sky. End of chapter 11《 Chapter Twelve of A Candle for Our Lady by Regina Victoria Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Twelve. Jem awakened in a great four poster bed in the manor house, his head swathed in bandages, his body limp and aching. Through the parted blue damask curtains, he saw Joan. Behind her, now approaching, was Isabel. She held a cup of clear liquid in her hand. He's awake, Joan. Thanks be. You've come to yourself. And she held the cup to Jem's lips. Drink this. Wha- what is it? Jem was a mite suspicious, remembering Grandmother Reynolds' occasional bitter-tasting potions. Aconite. I brewed it myself from the white and purple monk's hood in our garden. To allay fever. He downed it in a gulp, surprised by its blandness. Then I- Ay, but you're fortunate to have no more than fever, after such a bash on the head. And indeed you deserved worse, Joan cut in, for your hot-head interference. Much trouble all this has been to good Sir William. Isabel saw the darkening in Jem's eyes. Now, Joan, don't be distressing the lad the moment he opens his eyes. Sir William knows you only meant to help him. But I didn't help. Jem set his lips hard to hide their trembling and when his sister left the room, he confided, Joan's right, of course. I've only brought more trouble on her benefactor. What's this I hear of trouble? Sir William demanded, coming in through the open door. Well, well, young man, I see you're mending. Glad I am for that. He strode over to the bed and took one of Jem's hands in his own strong grip. Twas quite a blow you got, but as the leech says, the young men easily. Had not that missile found you as a target, it would have got me and my older head might have proved a deal more brittle. A surge of joy rushed up in Jem. You mean, he struggled to raise himself, I really took that blow for you, sir? He fell back gasping, partly from weakness, but partly from happy pride. The knight nodded. Therefore my anxiety for you, son, but it's all right, between the ministrations of the leech and of this little lass. He put an arm around Isabel's slim shoulders. You're going to be sound as a good apple. Isabel blushed like a wild rose at the knight's compliment. Shouldn't we give the chief credit to Our Lady of Walsingham? Indeed. You see, Jem, how she takes care of her defenders? I believe it, sir, and I would go now to the chapel to thank her. Nay, nay, not yet, but we'll take her our thanks and yours. Sir William forced Jem gently back, and then led Isabel from the sun-dabbled chamber. Within a few days, Jim was able to leave his bed for short periods. In Sir William's garden, glowing with pale yellow primroses, fragrant with pinks, lilacs, and daffodils, he saw the knight talking with Mr. Thomas Sidney. That the visitor was in no conciliatory mood was evident by his hard-set, down-drooping mouth. Am I to understand, Sir William, that you refuse damages to my property committed by your people? No, Mr. Sidney. A reasonable settlement I'm ready to make. But what you ask, sir, is exorbitant. Moreover, the damage was not one-sided. Three of my tenants and a lad who is my guest were seriously injured. It's not common for aggressors in a quarrel to claim damages. Well, that's my final word, Sir William, or I take the matter to the authorities. Sidney turned abruptly, and Jim, watching by the hedge, thought his scarlet-lined cloak whipped out in the wind like the wings of some huge bird of prey. At the gate Mr. Sidney turned. Remember, Sir William, I have some influence with those who are no friends to superstition and popery. Sir William was silent, but his gaze turned on Jim, who was shaking with anger. That, that vile man! Like all his kind, Jim, full of brag and blow. 
doubtless the lord cromwell likes the breed around him his own importance is so new he must needs create a legion of upstarts to bolster his unsubstantial greatness but he could denounce you to the king's council he could yet tis most unlikely not for many a year have i meddled in politics my loyalty to the crown is unassailable more than that my father fought for harry tudor's father ay and supported the welshman when he wrested the crown from the last plantagenet on bosworth field nay lad a waltham need neither fear nor favour such as yon parvenu the keen blue eyes rested kindly on jim's pallid face come if you're able and we'll have a look at the stables the black i rode that day is he all right sir we'll ask the groom and when they reached the great limestone stables so William bade the groom bring out the black gelding from his stall. Jem's eyes glowed when he saw the beautiful young animal, coat glistening like polished ebony, neck arched and slender limbs lifted as if he walked on clouds rather than solid turf. Jem's fingers caressed the silky mane. Perfect, isn't he? And he's yours. Sir William smiled at the swift passage from incredulity to joy that swept the boy's face. With my compliments a souvenir of our battle of walsingham mine jem shouted his surprise a horse of my own i've often dreamed of it but never of such a one as this he choked and hid his face for a moment against the shiny coat to conceal the sudden tears with the acquisition of roland as he was named jem improved so quickly that within another week he and jem were preparing for the return to bedford won't cousin will be surprised when he sees us coming mounted on roland said jem eyes shining with pride as he and joan rounded the stables after a morning's canter through the park i hate to leave waltham manor sir william and isabel said joan yet twill be good to see the farm again and cousin will father let hall and shag for the moment jem was back at their own little holding nestled in a pocket of the midlands watered by the willow fringed ree already the fields were spangled with buttercups and cowslips in another month they would be blanketed with gold and suddenly he knew it was the land he loved best in the world and always would red brown and sandy hard to cultivate but his own and his father's before him the stone spire of eyeworth parish church seen through a screen of elms the sound of the angelus pealing with silver echoes and ripples over the low countryside a sharp clop-clop of hoofs on the gravel of the courtyard brought him up with a start. A party of men dismounted and stirred up the steps. "'Sir William's having important guests,' said Joan. "'Important, I said Jim, noticing the embroidered arms and crests of the mounted men in the courtyard. "'What could it mean? Three gold leopards on a scarlet field surmounted by the crown.' Then Sir William appeared on the steps. "'This gentleman,' he told Jim and Joan, brings me a citation before the privy council nay nay tis no matter for alarm but i go now for london i'll be happy if you will remain here till my return be of good cheer and he lowered his voice a little commend me to our lady in stunned silence they watched sir william leave mounted on his own dapple gray stallion his figure stately under the fur-colored cloak but flanked and followed by the armed servants of the crown as they moved forward down the oak-lined path, Isabel came tripping around the path from the garden. She stopped in her tracks. What is it? Jim turned to answer her, his eyes somber, a catch in his voice. Sir William, he's a prisoner of the crown. End of chapter 12「Chapter 13 of A Candle for Our Lady » by regina victoria hunt this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese chapter thirteen come you've done enough work for today isabel called to jim as she and joan came into the orchard bearing trays of bread cold meat and a pitcher of milk it's midday and the sun's too hot to work reluctantly jim dropped to the ground from the spreading apple tree capped with a foam of pink blossoms it had been good to put his hands to work again, Reeves seeing to it that he performed only the lighter tasks, and indeed he was quite fit, only a purplish bruise and a thin scar over the left temple remained as evidence of his near-fatal wound. But his mind was burdened with thought of his benefactor. 
Laying aside pruning fork and shears, he asked, No more word from Sir William? Not but that he sent father, Isabel replied, pouring a mug of milk for each of them, that he was well accommodated in London, and daily expected his hearing before the council. A week ago, Joan was thoughtfully chewing a thick slice of cold beef. He has been gone over a fortnight. Jim clenched his hands. Oh, I wish I'd gone along with him. You couldn't then, Isabel reminded him. You weren't strong enough to ride that far. Anyway, said Joan, what possible assistance could you have been? A country boy not yet fourteen. At least I'd known how tis faring with him, and then— a spark lighted Jim's eyes. I do know someone at court. At court? Isabel's face was now alive with interest. You, Jim? Joan stared at her brother, as if she thought the delirium returning. Why, why, brother, are you out of your mind? No, no, Jim laughed at their expressions. Think, Joan, have you forgotten the Norrises? The squire of Norham Hall and his nephew, who stayed with us the night just before last Martinmas? Oh, Joan breathed in relief. Aye, but— Well, Richard Norris bade me at parting to seek him out if ever I came to London. Jim broke off as Reeves, the steward, strode into the orchard from the manor walk. A look of worry creased the servant's brows. Best you get indoors, youngsters. Why, father? Isabel asked, but she was on her feet instantly, gathering up their dishes. There's a company coming through the park, villagers mostly— they're in a riotous mood. It may be they blame Sir William. Blame Sir William? Jim followed quickly through the garden, and thence to the rear of the manor house. For what? Interfering twixt them and Sydney, they're at Walsingham. Fools. Reeves was losing patience with the situation. Think they'd see Sir William was only trying to save them from disaster, and such bloody vengeance as overtook the Lincoln rioters and the Pilgrims of Grace. As they reached the raftered hall, Shouts of, Sir William Waltham, and, Restore the shrine, mingle with a dangerous chant, Down with Cromwell's gang, down with Sidney. The old porter appealed to Reeves. What shall I do? Shall I say the master? No, Reeves took up his steward's staff and held it truncheon-like before him. Emit two or three as spokesmen. The porter relayed the word, and Jim saw two stalwart figures enter through the heavy oaken doors. Before these could be closed, a dozen more had pushed through behind them. "'We want Sir William,' was their gruff greeting when they saw only the steward. "'State your business,' Reeves demanded, while Jim beside him felt mounting dread, mingled with a thrill born of danger. He was conscious, too, of the girls hovering behind him, dependent on them for protection. "'We want the shrine restored, Reeves, and we want Sir William's hand on a petition to be sent up to London to the council.' "'Oh!' Reeves' face relaxed a bit. You're a little late for that, friends. No matter for just, Reeves, said one of the men. We know well enough that the chapel, the priory, I, the very image of Our Lady, have been destroyed, but will petition the King's grace to make restitution, unless Sir William has been cozened by Cromwell's hirelings. Sir William, the steward replied tartly, is a prisoner. He's in London at this moment, awaiting hearing before the King's council. A prisoner? The whole delegation showed surprise. Sidney's work? Who else? Come, let's avenge good Sir William. We'll fire Sidney's house. Hold! Reeves was wholly exasperated now, and Jem thought a little afraid, for this news of the knight's detention had the effect of fuel added to already blazing fire. Have you no sense at all? It's for incitation to riot and sedition that Sir William stands accused. Any act of violence now, especially towards Sydney, would only serve as testimony against my master. Jem watched the faces of the men gathered there under the oak beam ceiling. The atmosphere was tense, explosive, and the steward, though he spoke truth, lacked both the power of authority and the art of suasion. Impulsively, Jem said, Why don't you petition the King's grace for Sir William's release? Petition? One of the tenants was interested. Well, now, the lad speaks sense. We'll show that Sir William was denounced out of private malice. He called to one of their number. Here, Master Scrivener, let's frame another petition. In a few minutes, the small bespeckled notary was seated at the drawing table, 
while the men of manor and village stood around him, dictating the suggested additions to their petition. As the quill scratched over the sheet of parchment, Jim glanced at his companions, catching the grateful look in Reeve's eyes, the admiration in Isabel's. Even Joan, who didn't often approve Jim's impulsive gestures, appeared relieved and a little proud. When the writing was finished, and they had all, including the steward, set their hands to it, the question rose, Who will be the bearer to London? A short embarrassed silence enveloped the group. Then talk resumed. "'Twill be a week's journey at best, a fortnight or more there and back. A considerable charge, too. Well, we'll all contribute to a purse. Reeves, you're the man of us all with most reason and influence. I dare not, the steward protested. Sir William would never excuse my leaving the manor in his absence. Aye, that's true, just your charge. But who in London would hear us country clods anyway? A thought that had been simmering in Jem's mind for some time now leaped forth. They'll heed me. In the silent silence he went on, I have a connection at court, a gentleman who is in personal attendance on the king. You're young, lad, for such an errand said the whore-headed villager who had done most of the talking. And not of the duchy, added Reeves. All the better, insisted Jem, cheeks flushed, a sparkle of enthusiasm in his voice. My youth will testify to my innocence, and that I am a stranger will witness to Sir William's goodness and to the fame of Walsingham Shrine. Very well, boy, said Reeves, seeing the rest easily persuaded by Jem's untutored eloquence. But remember, London's an evil place to be a stranger. In these suspicious times, any unwary speech or action can trust one, like a fowl, on the Lord Cromwell's skewers. Jim laughed, his dark eyes dancing. I'm too small a bird for his lordship's spit, and if you'll trust me with the parchment, I'll be going. Today? Jim was incredulous, as, taking the parchment, Jim headed for the stables. Why not? The sooner the better for Sir William's sake. Let me go with you, she begged as he saddled Roland. What, a little girl? No, no, stay you here with Isabel. Jem blushed and became very busy with Roland's girth strap, for, just as he mentioned her name, Isabel chipped into the stable. I came to wish you Godspeed, she said with that tilt of the head that gave her face and form an elfin look. Thanks, said Jem, thinking how the sunlight caught her hair like spun gold. He led Roland out and sprung into the saddle. We'll be praying for the success of your mission, won't we, Joan? Yes, at Our Lady of Walsingham Shrine in the chapel. With a quick motion, Isabel reached up and slipped something small and shining into Jim's hand. For your journey, she whispered, as, hand in hand with Joan, she hurried inside. End of chapter 13《ชั่ e ร์ที่14ของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของพระเจ้าของ He had felt a thrill at sight of the fabled mass of the tower and the tall spire of St. Paul's, atop Ludgate Hill, catching the first rosy glow of sun, while all its lesser fellows still lurked in blue shadows. Dropping into the nearest church, it was dedicated, he noticed, to St. Olive, King of Norway. He heard mass and gave thanks for his safe journey, coupled with a prayer for the success of his mission. His next business was to obtain food for Roland and himself. Finding a public stable in an open court in a cook shop nearby, he left Roland gratefully munching oats while he breakfasted on porridge, wheat cakes, and ale. Then he began to make inquiries about the court. Here was his first difficulty. Though himself from the Midlands, he could scarcely make himself understood by the Cockneys, and their speech was to him equally unintelligible, seeming a mere nasal jumble of contractions. Leaving the cookhouse to fetch Roland, he put his question to the stableman. He met the same puzzled stare, though the man was quick enough to seize the silver and copper coins he offered, biting them to test their worth. As Jim repeated his question, a man in a substantial coat and riding a good horse drew up. 
he glanced at Jim, almost with affection, as an exile greets one from his home. Perchance I can help you, lad, he said, dismounting. Jim turned to him with relief. At least you understand me, sir. The merchant, for such he seemed, laughed. I'm from Dunstable, and I'd guess you're not far. Iworth, near Palton, though I'm just come from Norfolk on business. At court? The man ran a shrewd eye over Jim's homespun clothes, and another over Roland, marking the contrast. Jim flushed. At least with one in the king's service. Tell me, sir, is the court now at Greenwich, or— No, here, yonder at Whitehall. The gentleman pointed west and south toward the river. Whitehall? Jim was puzzled by the name. Twas formerly called York Place, being the London Palace of the Archbishops of York. One of those, in a lower tone, that the king took when the great Cardinal Wolsey fell into disgrace. Oh, how does one reach it? Either by barge at the river stairs, or, since you have your horse, landward along the strand, passing Temple Bar. With many thanks, Jim bade him good day, and mounting Roland set out for the strand. As the day wore on and the great city awoke to teeming, bustling, jostling life, the thrill of adventure, the novelty of his situation, even the urgency of his errand, dull before the overwhelming immensity of London. The city sprawled over both sides of the broad, silver-green Thames, and the bewildering mass of roofs and turrets and steeples. The narrow, intersecting streets were more like ravines between cliffs than thoroughfares, and led he knew not where. Not even the river, when he got a good look at it, offered an unobstructed view, but was spanned here and there by bridges crowded with houses and shops, while the water teemed with barges and sailboats and lighters loaded with cargoes for the war and merchant ships docked below Tower Wharf and at Deptford. A clamor of bells and whistles and cartwheels and hoofbeats, the cries of vendors and the clang of street signs deafened Jem with their continual uproar. The odor of rotting refuse, dumped into open canals, assailed his nostrils and turned him half sick. But he managed a wan smile as he remembered how, not so long ago, he had drowsed by the willows of his native re and daydreamed of coming up to London, as a knight of Arthurian legend might have dreamed of the Holy Grail. Well, like it or not, here he was with a duty to perform. So with an encouraging pat on Roland's black head, he turned him westward through crowded Fleet Street. Dodging riders, pedestrians, dogs, and coaches, he passed the recently repainted post that marked Temple Bar, the city's boundaries, and entered by way of the Strand into Westminster. Again the sight was dazzling though not quite in the way of London proper. Here there were vast stone and brick structures, capped with turrets and spires and interspersed with courts, and straight ahead was a gate tower of checkered blue and red stone, with two octagonal turrets, pierced with leaded windows, that caught the sun's rays in a burning blaze. Jim drew in his breath at the sudden beauty. Whitehall? A liveried officer nodded briefly and pointed to a narrow archway east of the main entrance for carriages. Jim dismounted in the court beyond, facing a large walled tennis court. How, he wondered, in this maze of buildings, courts, gardens, and galleries, would he ever find Richard Norris? But the groom who took Roland in charge directed him through what he called the privy garden, glowing with poppies, fuchsias, and roses, and borders of pansies and crocuses, up a short flight of stairs to the stone gallery. Here, for the first time, Jim found himself stopped by a sentry with a gleaming axe-headed halbert. Pass or password? the sentry demanded. Jim, of course, had neither, but he put on a bold front. I'm but newly come to London, too, to see a friend, Mr. Richard Norris, groom of the King's Chamber. Allowed to pass, he was immediately met by an usher demanding his credentials again. Jim gave his name and business and was bidden to wait among a group of visitors. Now that he was here, almost touching the awful machinery estate, he felt a little dizzy. A mere country lad, who a fortnight back never expected to see London, or look on the face of his king, now commissioned with an affair of the Privy Council? He tried to strengthen his wavering spirits by repeating Sir William Waltham's motto, God helping, there's nothing to fear. But the lights danced disturbingly on the tapestries, lining the wall, on the mass of jovial likeness of King Henry himself, on the bejeweled befurred personages bustling to and fro. One among these last drew Jim's attention, 
a heavy middle-aged man in a black furred robe a black square crowned cap topping a pasty face from which the flesh hung slack in a tier of double chins a counsellor perhaps for he seemed to be reading notes something in that watchful secretive face in the darting glance of those small rodent-like eyes sent a chill through jim he didn't even see the usher return until he spoke sorry master reynolds mr norris is in attendance on the king at greenwich when jim began dismayed for even now sir william's fate hung in the balance can't say a few days a week perhaps i've come a long way from waltham manor norfolk urgency impelled jim to cast prudence to the wind my business concerns sir william waltham the flabby man in the black cap turned a little smile touching his thin lips perhaps i can help you young man you're here on behalf of sir william waltham e yes sir my lord jim cast an appealing glance at the usher master reynolds it is the lord cromwell the usher whispered and quickly bowed away cromwell jim felt his heart lurch again his brain turned giddy cromwell the man whose name was a terror to the kingdom he who was the author and the mastermind of the condemnation of bishop fisher of thomas more of the suppression of the monasteries of walsingham shrine itself yet the voice beside him spoke gently i will gladly serve you in the case of sir william waltham if i can you have additional evidence this my lord and jim pulled out the petition by the light of a crescent overhead cromwell perused the document ah oh, yes yes i see well now go master reynolds and get some rest you'll be summoned when he smiled when a decision has been reached in a daze but marvelously relieved jim bowed and started down the stairs he had scarcely reached the bottom when he felt his arms seized from behind then he found himself between guards w what's this vainly he tried to wrench free you are under arrest master reynolds we have orders to convey you to the gatehouse End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of a candle for our lady by regina victoria hunt this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese chapter fifteen jim paced to and fro in the narrow cell in a turret of the keat house where he had been confined for a week it seemed an eternity since he had last seen the sun and walked among free men here the heavy hours were broken only by the entrance of the guard who brought his meals of peace porridge bread and water twice a day it would have been distracting to see something of the traffic passing by and through the great gate but the barred window though admitting some filtered light was set too high so the constant sound of footsteps hoofs and wheels on the cobblestones below was but an added aggravation there were bells and chimes too periodically pealing above the common clamour some sounding faint and far away as from the city or southwark others so close he guessed they must be from ancient westminster abbey founded by the sainted king edward but one peal he missed the angelus so familiar to him at home once he ventured to ask the guard the reason for this omission and was told that the angelus had been expressly forbidden so the gloom closed around him soon he would lose count even of the days why was he being held the question rose again and again to torment him. Any subject had the right to petition. He had violated no law, nor had he been arrested on a specific charge. Obviously it was the work of Cromwell, who wanted... What? To suppress any knowledge, any testimony in favor of Sir William Waltham, who had incurred the displeasure of his creature, Sidney? That seemed the only possible answer to the riddle. Jim's anger rose in red fury against the minister's treachery and against himself for having been so easily tricked at last he dropped on a pallet of straw which served as both bed and bench and sat staring at the shafts of sunlight crossing the stone floor reflecting the bars of the window from his doublet he drew out the silver medal of our lady that isabel had thrust into his hand as he set out with such high purpose from waltham manor for your journey he heard her lilting voice now as a kind of mocking echo could they see his present plight, she and Joan? But for the gravity of it, they might be excused for laughing. 
Of course Joan wouldn't laugh. She'd scold and say, See where your hot-headedness gets you. So far, indeed, instead of aiding Sir William, he had merely got himself in Reeve's phrase, Trust on Lord Cromwell's skewers. A grating of the heavy lock told him that the guard was coming with his midday meal. In the first days of his captivity, he had awaited the guard's coming, hopefully, and met him with the question, Is Mr. Norris come? But the answer was always the same, always. Not yet. Today he didn't even lift his head as the man entered and muttered, There. All right, set it down. I'm not. Jim broke off with a gasp, for two girlish figures slept toward him, one threw her arms around him. Jim, Jimmy, we found you at last. Joan? Joan! His voice rose high and cracked. He held her off, staring into the face under the gray hood. Then over her shoulder, he caught the amber eyes of Isabel Reeves, eyes sparkling now between tears and laughter. Miss Isabel? Aye, Jimmy, we're not really ghosts, though for a time we feared you might be. But how? Come, sit here. He pulled them down on the pallet, one on each side. Tis the only place to sit. Hurriedly, interrupting each other, the girls told how they became alarmed at hearing neither from him nor from Sir William, and of how they finally persuaded Isabel's father to let them come up to visit an aunt who lived in London. Not alone, Jim broke in. Oh, no. There was with us a manservant father often sends up to the city on business, and he carried a letter my father wrote to my aunt to explain the matter. But how did you know where to look for me? We knew you intended to present the petition, Joan began. And where except the court, Isabel added. Jim nodded. Aye, and that was shrewd. Then you've spoken of Sir Richard Norris, said Joan. He's not here, her brother replied, shaking his head. Oh, but now he is, Isabel said triumphantly. Jim sprang up. He is? Yes, said Joan. He returned with the king this morning. I wonder you didn't hear the din of it. Jim laughed shortly. Din I hear all day long. You forget. Then he looked ruefully at the high window. I'd have to be a rook or gall to see from that lookout. Besides, put in Isabel, the royal party came by water, landing at the river stairs. Anyway, she hesitated with a sidewise glance at Joan. Jim, Joan took up the cue. Don't get all excited, but Mr. Norris thinks he can obtain your release. My release? The black-capped, double-chinned face of the royal vicar general suddenly blotted out Jim's rosy vision of freedom. Aye, but we dare not cross the Lord Cromwell. Cromwell? Joan said in dismay. Surely you've not offended. T'was on Cromwell's private orders that I was committed. Oh, Jim, murmured Isabel. Joan shook her head sadly. Brother, how could you be so rash? Don't you know Sir William's fate hangs? Of course I knew, Joan. That's why I thought any risk worth while. But I was a fool, a stupid fool. And he turned from them, his face flushed with shame. He took no note of the quick, firm steps outside on the stone corridor, until a tall, velvet-clad figure stooped under the low lintel and entered, asking, where is our young Bedford jailbird? Mr. Mr. Richard Norris, Jim stammered, almost choking. Mary, help us. The lively hazel eyes swept over his tousled black hair and dusty doublet and hose. What's your brother done, Mistress Joan, to fall foul of our biggest mogul on his first visit to London? The tone of the voice was teasing, but the long hands that grasped Jim's were warm and friendly. Come, let's get out of this stinking hole. I... I'm really free? Jem seemed unable to believe it. Ay, ay, and I'd like to see you fed and groomed after pledging my credit to the hilt to bail you out of the vicar general's little den. Jem stopped suddenly on the stairs. You mean, sir, you really had to put up bail for me? Richard patted his shoulder. Nay, nay, I was but jesting. No question of bail. You weren't indicted, just a privy order of the Lord Cromwell. But how did you get me released? Oh, a word to the Duke of Norfolk. He's the greatest man in the kingdom, as to blood, though overshadowed now by the new men. All the same, he still has some influence with King Harry, and likes to show it. A great hope sprang to life in Jem's mind. 
Then mightn't he use it for Sir William Waltham? And the restoration of Walsingham Shrine? Joan added. A swift glance of apprehension crossed the young courtier's face. He quickened his pace through the privy garden. Come, we'll go to my lodgings. Even birds carry messages here. End of chapter 15「sixteen of a candle for our lady by regina victoria hunt this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by maria therese chapter sixteen by twisting paths and winding stairs he brought the trio to a small apartment with a window on the thames it had they noticed a good hardwood floor spread with fresh rushes which gave it in this small place of varied odours a most agreeable air a small console table, carved in Italian style, and perhaps an import, stood near the mullioned window, and a cabinet, similarly carved, against the opposite wall. There were two chairs, still a rarity to rural people, and a cushioned bench or form set near the door. Masking the walls were rather faded tapestries that curtained off an alcove serving as a tiny bedchamber. "'Sit there, Jemmy,' his host moved a chair to the table." Then he turned to a dark oak built in cupboard and carved appetizing slices of fowl for his half-famished guest. As you say, his grace of Norfolk has an interest in the case of Sir William Waltham, and in Our Lady's shrine, seeing as it lay in his own duchy. But this is a touchy matter. His grace has not so far recovered from the eclipse of three years back, to challenge the vicar general openly, or an affair of great moment. Yet the charge against Sir William can't be— Jim broke off, groping for the right legal term. Capital, I suppose you mean? Richard Norris smiled sadly. Ordinarily, no. Supposing the charge true, damage to one man's property resulting from a minor riot will be punishable only by fine and perhaps a short term of imprisonment. But these aren't ordinary times. Have you forgot what my uncle and I told you last autumn? About the Pilgrims of Grace? Aye, and the Lincoln Rioters and neither case was their treason, actual or meditated. Yet were they cut down and hanged without mercy, women, children, religious and all. Only for protesting suppression of monasteries, the enclosures, and demanding dismissal of Cromwell as the author of these things. And so the protesters are dead, and Cromwell more than ever the king's master. Isn't there something we can do? Joan asked. There must be some way we can come to the king, said Jim. A way there is. Richard drew up the other chair, seating himself close to Jim. What way, Mr. Norris? Jim felt an inner surge of excitement. Of a morning, the king always attends mass. Then usually, before breakfast, he goes to the tennis court. There are seldom many about him, then. As he leaves, you could stand in the passageway and present your petition. Why, lad, what is it? Are you so terrified of facing our bluff King Howe that you turn lily white? Jim had indeed gone pale, though not at the thought of the king. Oh, Mr. Norris, I, I'm a sorry fool. I haven't the petition. Richard looked at him a little surprised. Oh, t'was taken from you at your commitment? Nay, sir, tis even worse. I... Jim hung his head, not daring to look at any of them. I gave it myself to the Lord Cromwell. Cromwell? Venturing a glance at him, Jim saw the staggered look in Richard Norris's eyes. Rising, Norris paced back and forth across the small chamber. Aye, tis like his subtle sleight of hand. He got his training among the Florentine money changers, and they say Niccolo Machiavelli's treatise on diplomacy, a thing called the Prince, is his only credo. Oh, Jim, Joan cried, how could you be so, so simpleton? Now, Miss Joan, to the young courtier. Don't be hard on the lad. Many a grey beard skilled in politics has been tripped up by a wily vicar general, but I must have a little time to figure a way out of this pass. It was decided that the girls would return to the home of Isabel's aunt, but Jim should remain at Whitehall. Meantime, Richard would find how matters stood with Sir William. Joan would come again in the morning, and Isabel, with a heartening smile for Jim, said she would pray for surely our lady would never forsake her devoted client, Sir William. Know yourself and Joan, she added, for the love you've shown her. 
Thanks, Jim murmured quickly, and for the moment he felt confident and reassured. But after they had gone and young Norris left for his duties, time dragged heavily. For a while, Jim watched the ever-changing traffic on the river, gilded barge prows and poops dyed bronze shining like gold in the sun, sails thick as clouds with flocks of gulls, wings tipped silver, wheeling and diving like an aerial fleet above them. But thoughts of the growing greatness of England's commerce only reminded Jim of her sovereign. Henry Tudor, with his little twinkling eyes and small mouth set in the great red moon of a face, the man who had gone on a winter's journey barefoot to Our Lady's shrine, yet who had destroyed it, who had loved good Sir Thomas More, yet had him slain, who devoutly heard Mass every day, yet crucified Christ anew in his members. What hope had he, Jimmy Reynolds, an obscure yeoman lad, not yet fourteen, of winning back to reason, to justice and mercy, this soul so consumed in self-love as to strike down all who stood in his path? It was with relief and springing hope that he heard Richard Norris open the door, but a glance at the young man's face was not reassuring. What have you heard? Anything of Sir William? Aye, something, but brace yourself, lad. He took a quick turn about the chamber. I spoke again with Norfolk. Sir William's to be examined before the council once more. Then tis like he'll be sent to the tower. The tower? Jim's voice was hollowed like an echo. The dread tower of London from which so many of late years, Moore and Fisher and the holy Carthusians, have been brought forth to die. Was this to be Sir William's fate? Jim caught at a straw. When, when does the council meet? At ten o'clock in the morning. But, Jimmy, lad, you're not thinking. I, Jim replied, quickly, fire in his eyes. Five minutes alone with the king before the council meets. Five minutes. You'll help me, Dick Norris. Richard Norris cast a glance, half resigned, half despairing, at the ceiling. I, I'll help you. And Our Lady help us both. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of a Candle for Our Lady by Regina Victoria Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Seventeen. Richard Norris was as good as his word. Just before time to attend the king to mass, Joan had come, and he had shown the pair where they must stand in a passage of the chief close tennis court, fronting the street. And I pray you wait till the king's majesty comes out after the game. Probably I'll play him. And so, he flashed a quick smile, so as to humor him. But be brief as you can, for His Majesty has no care for long speeches, unless sometimes his own. Majesty? Joan asked. Is it so you address the king? Aye, and I must warn you, he's insistent on the point. Oh, I know, tis new usage in England, but the king will take offense if he's given a lesser title than those long borne by the emperor and the kings of France. Richard glanced at the crystal hourglass on the console table. Now I must go. Remember, Jim, and Our Lady be with you. The door closed after him, and Joan, slipping the blue hood back from her dark curls, turned to Jim. What did he mean, Jim? That I am to begin by thanking the king for my release, and to ask for the return of Roland. Jim hoped the butterfly feeling in his stomach wasn't reflected in his face. Waiting in Dick Norris's little chamber soon became unbearable. They decided to make their way slowly through the privy gallery, trying to admire the fine wood carving and the tapestries from the looms of Italy, France, and Flanders, all glowing with a myriad rich tones in the light of wall brackets and daylight filtered through windows set high above. Armed now with a paper from Norris, they passed ushers, guards, and sentries unquestioned, and descended to the privy garden. There Jim halted a catch in his breath. What is it? Joan's eyes told how startled she was. Jim nodded toward a massive, dark-robed figure, then turned away. Cromwell, he whispered, and taking Joan's hand, he whisked her behind one of the tall, vine-clad columns that supported the long arbor. Did he see you? I don't know, but I dare not meet him. Joan ventured a peek. He's talking with a prelate, a little man with a rabbit-like face. It's likely Dr. Cramner, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Dick Norris had told Jim of the primate's influence in collaboration with Cromwell. Worse and worse to be caught by those two. Where are they? 
Walking away. Which direction? Out toward the street. Jim groaned. Just the way we'll have to take. Look, said Joan, they couldn't know or suspect me. I'll follow them a ways, just to see where they go. Jim nodded. But return quickly, lest we become separated. He waited, sweating with nervousness. Suppose they, too, were waiting for the king to come to the tennis court. Suppose. But there was Joan, darting out of the stream of people along the garden path. He saw from the glow in her cheeks she was unusually excited. Come, it's all right, she said, taking his arm. I got so close I could hear them speak. What did they say? Jim asked as they went toward the tennis court. The little man, did you say he's the archbishop? He mentioned the council meeting. And the Lord Cromwell? Said they'd send the Norfolk knight to the tower, that he had a privy warrant prepared. Jim's heart sank heavily. Then tis good as done, Joan, and I don't see what good our appeal can do. Joan shook him by the shoulder. For shame, brother. Sure you haven't come all this journey. I and suffered imprisonment yourself, only to grow faint-hearted now. Jim braced his shoulders and lifted his head. Nay, I'll see it through. And perhaps, he added to himself, perhaps Our Lady will deign to help me. Reaching the gallery of the empty court, they saw two figures below, one on either side of the dividing rope. One, tall and supple, clad in green satin, was Dick Norris. The other was much older, but with something of the huge boy about him still. His close-shaven or near-bald head and great red face topped a massive figure not diminished by the gold satin doublet, cut and slashed with white taffeta and the scarlet hose. Henry Tudor, King of the English. Jim and Joan stood with held breath and clasped hands, not understanding the play, just watching the ball as it bounded back and forth, and these two figures, so contrasted, wielding the little rackets. A great shout of laughter from the king announced that it was over. Evidently he was pleased with the result, for he kept slapping his gentleman on the back as they started slowly toward the exit. Jim saw Richard lift his head slightly, as a signal, and he pulled Joan after him down the stairs. They arrived at the bottom, breathless and wide-eyed, just as Norris handed the king his small crown jeweled hat. "'God's splendor!' bellowed King Harry as the pair catapulted across his path. What have we here? Two of your younger subjects, sire, said Richard, come to admire your majesty's game. And to thank your, your majesty. Jim struggled with the parched feeling in his throat, the hammering of his head, as he knelt before this great hulk of a man with the little twinkling eyes and the small pursed mouth. Thank me? For what? Showing you a good game, boy. Why, you should have seen me when I was Dick Norris's age, before I got this cursed swelling in my leg. I was a match for any of them, tennis, wrestling, swimming, riding, what you will. Ah, but time, time, and age are villains. Norris interrupted. Sire, what mean you to speak of age? You are in the prime. Nay, nay, friend Dick, flatter me not. I am turned eight and forty this June, well you know. Already he had started on, and Jem saw his chance slipping. Sire! It was Joan's voice, high and girlish. She swept round before the king, almost dragging Jim with her. My brother is in debt to you. He wanted to thank you for his freedom. Freedom? Oh! A momentary frown drew the flaring sandy brows together. What freedom, boy? Who are you? A countryman by your speech. I, sire. Suddenly a great stream of courage flowed into Jim. He spoke up crisp and clear. I'm James Reynolds, Iworth in Bedford, and I was cast into the gatehouse yonder merely for bearing a petition to your majesty. His grace of Norfolk brought the injustice to your majesty's notice. I thank you, therefore, for my freedom, and would beg you also to order return of my horse. Freedom? Petition? Return of a horse? God's thunder! What's all this? Dick Norris, you're party to this somehow. And the little blue eyes jabbed the young courtier, so as to make Jim tremble for his friend. But Richard Norris was equal to the challenge. "'Tis true, sire. The lad's horse, a fine black gelding, was taken on his commitment and hasn't been returned." Henry waved a broad, heavy hand. "'Well, well, let the beast be released to his owner. 
"'Tis something queer,' he added suspiciously. "'How a lad of your station comes by such an animal?' "'Twas a present, sire, from Sir William Waltham of Waltham Manor, Norfolk, on whose behalf I came hither to petition. Jim was out of breath, and he stood with heavily beating heart, watching the effect of his words on the king. So that's the way of it. Henry's scowl was deep now, his red, hairy hand on which burned a great ruby, robbed, Jim had been told, from St. Thomas Becket's shrine at Canterbury, stroked his heavy square chin. I might have guessed politics lay at the bottom of this. Again he darted a suspicious glance at the unruffled young courtier. Well, Henry bellowed so suddenly that Joan jumped. Where's your petition, boy? Twas, twas taken, sire. Taken? By whom? By the Lord Cromwell. Jim gulped. The questions came so fast. I, I thought he meant to present it to your majesty. Now Richard Norris ventured to explain. Sire, twas during your absence. No doubt the vicar general hasn't had time to present it. Fetch him, Henry commanded, beginning to fume like a restive bull. At once, sire. And Richard threw Jim a heartening glance before he melted into the dark passage. Henry meant to get to the bottom of this. He turned meanwhile to Jim. Tell me, how has Waltham gotten broiled? He was unjustly denounced to your grace's council. Majesty, lad, majesty. If the German emperor and the most Christian king are addressed as majesty, shall the king of the English be less? Well, why was the Norfolk knight denounced? Because, sire, he refused to pay exorbitant damages demanded by a gentleman of Walsingham, damages to the gentleman's newly acquired property on the site of Our Lady's shrine. So Waltham's people rioted and damaged the fellow's property? That's breaking the king's peace, and smacks of sedition. Henry broke off, for the sinister figure in dark furred robe and flat cap now approached, followed by Norris. Your Majesty sent for me? Here again was the silken voice Jim too well remembered. Already the beady eyes that fastened on him and accurately pigeonholed him, Jim was sure. Thomas Cromwell was not the man to forget anyone. I, Tom, this country lad brought a petition concerning Waltham, the Norfolk knight. He gave it to you? I, sire. Well, where is it? Really, sire, it seems too inconsequential for your majesty's notice. Henry banged his fist on his other palm. By the splendor of God, I'll be the judge of its consequence. Yes, sire, of course, but now the council. The council will wait, till midnight if I say so. Get that petition, Tom, and let's have no more dawdling. I haven't breakfasted that I might receive our lord this morning. Away with you. And he waved the vicar general out, as if he were no more than a taverner, which, in truth, he once was. Obsequiously, Cromwell retired, though Jim didn't miss the venom in his glance. He saw now that even he was not too small a bird for Cromwell's skewers. There was no bird too small. Henry continued to growl. So the good people of Walsingham resist what we in our fatherly love think best for the state of religion? They rage and riot, forsooth, because a few crypts and bones and jeweled baubles are swept away? Your Majesty was added to those baubles. It was Joan who spoke up without a tremor. Henry swung round, as if to strike her, yet something stayed him. Joan finished much of what she had meant to say, and made a winter journey to Our Lady. The red hands clenched to anger. Be still. What does a country chit know more of religion than I, than the scholars, the theologians of Europe? We're simple folk, sire. We know only that we love God and those who are near to him. Above all, his blessed mother. Think you I pay her less court, because we've cast out the trappings? Is the queen of heaven the poor for the few trinkets swept from the altars? What need has she of these things? None, sire. Jem spoke up finally, surprised by his own calmness. But we need her. And how can this land of hers, her dowry, prosper who refuse the public homage all our Christian forebears have reverently paid her? If we despoil and destroy and hand over to grasping men these signs and emblems of our Father's love, are we not the same in the sight of God, our Lady, and the saints, as in that of men, were we to rob the images and tombstones of our natural parents? 
the blue eyes under the flaring brows regarded him half in anger half in admiration god's thunder a yeoman lad turned preacher who taught you my yeoman father sire my grandmother and a plain good priest yonder at eyeworth but i have no learning i come only to plead for our lady and for our friend but now Cromwell returned with a parchment and hope leaped up in jim as henry took the scroll as you see sire said cromwell while the king scanned it this is of no moment being merely the defence set forth by the knight's tenants they are witnesses my lord the king returned they swear sir william strove to quell the riot and in fact did so that's true jim cried i saw it myself but said cromwell ignoring jim all these people are interested parties predisposed in favour of the accused all are papists sire men who would restore the bad old ways of romish domination and subordinate the crown to the crozier sire he pressed his advantage skilfully waltham is a wealthy man and without heirs ha is it so your majesty follows my thoughts with the emperor and the king of france intriguing against you you have need of all the treasure available and he finished with a whisper in the king's ear with dawning horror, Jem saw what lure Cromwell spread before the king, and the covetous gleam in Henry's eye. If Sir William were condemned, his estates were forfeit to the crown, another way to replenish the diminishing royal coffers. Confiscation, said Henry, musing. There are scarce grounds. Act of attainder, sire. Parliament will ratify it. From his ample pocket, Cromwell brought forth a paper and handed it to the king. Sign, sire, and it's done. Jim held his breath as the king snatched the paper. He could guess what it was, a privy warrant for Sir William's committal to the tower. So this was the end of his mission, the end for Sir William, too, and for all that was loyal and good and true in the land so long our lady's dowry. There was no misreading the triumph in Cromwell's steely eyes, nor the answering one in the gross, bloated face of the king. Craft and corruption had won. Jim's heart sank like a stone. For all the gentle warmth of the sunlit day, he shivered as with a cold wind blowing. Turning away, he dragged blindly to the exit tunnel. Sign, sire, Cromwell coaxed in his silky voice. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of A Candle for Our Lady by Regina Victoria Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Eighteen. Jim had reached the end of the passage before noticing that Jim was not with him. He hesitated, undecided, when he was almost hurtled off his feet by the arm thrown suddenly around him. Come, good lad, said Richard Norris. Ye plead it well, but to no purpose murmured Jem, pulling away from his friend. No purpose? Why, the king has refused to sign. He is going to release Sir William. Dazed, Jem stared up into Richard's face, scarce noticing the heavy, dark-robed figure of Cromwell as the minister brushed by him. In a second he was back in the arena, kneeling before the great hulk in gold and scarlet and pouring out his thanks. Nay, no one dictates to me, Henry thundered, least of all that scheming money-changer. I'll not be bribed or cozened into heresy, like the besotted German princes. Then, Jim heard his sister's voice grave and clear, Your Majesty will grant the petition and restore the shrine of our dear lady? Again the great ham of a fist smote the other palm. By the splendor of God, was ever man so beset? I would do so, if only to show my love toward my good people of Walsingham. I, and for remembrance, a pilgrimage I made when younger than you, little maid, in company with the king my father, and the lady Margaret my grandmother. But no, no, that's a day far gone. Tom's right there. The property's disposed to this fellow Sidney. But Waltham shall be released, and none shall have cause to say that the royal justice of England has ceased to shine before the world. The great moon of a face lit up as if with a strong light behind it. Then, quite suddenly, the light blinked out. Now again the face looked peevish and sullen, and old. He caught Richard's arm. Dick Norris, I haven't had my breakfast. 
As Henry limped away on the courtier's arm, Jim heard him mutter, All the same, they'll see. I love our lady of Walsingham. Still. It was afternoon when Sir William Waltham rejoined his friends in Richard Norris's rooms. He was wearing the boots and blue doublet in which he had ridden away from Waltham Manor, a little frayed from the long journey and continuous usage, but his strong-featured face was unclouded as ever, and his blue eyes were alight. They twinkled now as they heard Jim's story. "'Twould seem, lad, that you fared the worst of us two. You were actually incarcerated, whilst I, though securely detained, was comfortably accommodated. Jem smiled wryly. Reeve said I'd likely trust myself on Lord Cromwell's skewers. Yet I'm glad t'was me, not you, who had a taste of the prison cell. Sir William took the wine young Norris was dispensing in crystal glasses. There was talk of sending me to the Marshalsea yonder in Southwark. He gestured toward the south bank of the Thames. But I wasn't committed. Probably, Richard said, because Cromwell was pressing for the tower. Well, he raised his glass. To your health and liberation, Sir William. Thank you, thank you all. And now, since I'm anxious to return home, let's consider the future. Jem and Jen declared they must start immediately for Bedford. Sir William and Isabel, with a groom who had accompanied the girls to London, would head for Norfolk. Bidding farewell to Sir Richard Norris, who had so bravely befriended them, the trio, Jim mounted again on Roland, turned their faces east, passing the ancient monument of one king's love and piety, Charing Cross. At the little gabled house of Isabel's aunt off Cheapside, they found Isabel awaiting them. "'Sir William!' she cried at sight of him, and flew into his arms like a hummingbird. "'I knew it! I knew Our Lady wouldn't fail you!' The knight stroked her bright hair. And God bless you, child, for your faith. Now, if you've had enough of London, we'll wind our way homeward. Oh, yes, London's crowded and dirty, and it, it smells. How I shall love to be home again in Norfolk. And we in Bedford, won't we, Joan? said Jem. Isabel looked worried. I suppose I won't ever see you again. Jim swallowed hard and looked at Joan. Jen was busy tying her hood. But Sir William spoke up briskly. Why, of course you will. We'll see much more of these two. Because, you see, I'm owing them for my liberty and mean to repay the debt. Joan shall be like an adopted daughter with sufficient education and a dower to enable her to marry above her station. As for our lad here, he might have the makings of a lawyer. A lawyer? Me? Oh, no, Sir William, I dread poring over books of dry Latin, and the prospect of living here in London at the ends of court. I want only my inheritance, the good Midland acres my father's tilled and sowed and reaped before me, unencumbered by leases to greedy sheep herders. That you shall have. Still, a yeoman can profit by a little learning, say, two or three years at Cambridge. Sir William is right, Jem, said Joan. Father Lithall has said that, had our father known more of legal ways, he wouldn't have been so tricked by the weavers. And you can be a much more important man in your shire, Isabel added, appealing to Jim's ambition. Now Sir William smiled. Ay, and I dare say our Isabel wouldn't object to living on a Midland farm, provided a lettered, personable lad went with it. Jim glanced sideways at Isabel, seeing the pink glow in her face, and away again, feeling the same hot flush in his own eyes. Then he met Sir William's vivid blue eyes. I accept your most generous offer, sir, and the responsibilities that go with it. I will do my utmost, though I much fear there's little a mere countryman can do to stem the dark tide sweeping over England. It was agreed on then, and after a substantial repast, they set out, riding together out beyond the city walls. The long, early summer dusk had fallen before they reached the old Roman road, casting a blanket over the surrounding hills. But here and there lights twinkled from Coulter's windows, forming a little chain of stars to guide the travellers. "'It's odd,' said Jem, "'the difference even a few lights make.' "Ay, son,' Sir William agreed. "'And doesn't it make you think? About the darkness you spoke of. It's true, of course.' Despotism and greed are casting a heavy pall across our land, but there are always lights somewhere, and it's just such candles of faith and loyalty and courage as you two have lighted 
that will one day draw all England back to Walsingham. And then, he added quietly, like a prayer, then Our Lady will return to England. End of chapter 18 End of A Candle for Our Lady by Regina Victoria Hunt